confirmed by Okosi. The reality is when it is with the, with the inductions, they were in workshop format. We essentially, the way it worked was we would sit and listen to presentations from the different parts of business to help us understand the different components of, of business. So it's, it's not a meeting and therefore there would not be minutes um, from that perspective. Having listened to you, just having read Mr. Derater's account, in his account, from what you've read, he himself is not saying that he told us about a report. The reality is that even if the report was already there, we were not informed of a report. The, the manner in which Mr. Derater gave us the information about the investigation was very, very, very scant and the way he framed it, I cannot see how anybody could have come to the conclusion who was sitting in the room that it was a concluded investigation and that there was a report. Um, I find it very, very difficult to understand how we would have come to that conclusion. Therefore, if we told that there is an investigation, the natural assumption would be that it is an internal investigation within the organization funded by the organization, that it wouldn't just be Mr. Director that is a, uh, aware of the um, investigation, but it, as, it is, as it normally would go, once an investigation is concluded, it would then go to the audit committee. Um, my fellow board member is the chair of the audit and risk committee. The normal channel would then be, before it even serves at the board, is that the audit committee would be the committee that would interrogate and make sure that, um, the, that we've looked at it from all um, angles and then present it to the board. That has not happened. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. So please assist me and if you can, um, based on your recollection, narrate to us what is it exactly that Mr. Terata informed you about? Because in his submission he's saying he, he has informed you of the intelligence operation. So I'd like to get a sense briefly, what did he tell, uh, what did he inform you about and what was your reaction or response after the said information was shared with you. And two, in your inductions and workshops, there are no recordings, you don't keep records. Um, there are no recordings to be implemented. Um, as such, those would need to be uh, recorded uh, because an induction or a workshop it has um, anticipated outcomes. So just also share with us um, how do you conduct your trainings and inductions? Um, Chair, through you, um, firstly in terms of what Mr. Derater told us, he only said that he's busy with an investigation. There was nothing in what he said that would have given us an indication that it was an intelligence operation and, as I said earlier on, the full scope of what he was busy with. So under normal circumstances, given the context um, of, the, of the, the entity, and I can say for perhaps from my background, I used to be the CEO of the Institute of Internal Auditors. When you hear the word investigation, you have a particular idea of what it is. Um, there was not enough information given to us for us at that point in time to interrogate further. There were questions asked when he, for example, um, when he said, I'm trying to remember who was it, I think it was the procurement person. He first said we and then he said I. Um, and because the, the question was asked, who's we? That's and he said I. So, but he specifically mentioned that he is busy with an investigation. And that's, the, that's as much as he, we were told on the day. Um, to ask, answer your question around an induction, an induction when you ask us how do we normally run these things, we were the new guys on the block. Um, an induction essentially is 
intended to ensure that people understand the lay of the land. Um, it is not intended to have outcomes. It's not a strategic session where the board engages with strategy. You can't expect new people to come in and make decisions before they understand what it is that they're working with. So that was the, um, at least in my understanding, the reason why we would go in, uh, through an induction. And that is common cause that that's what you would do in any organization. When a new board comes in, you take the board through an induction process so that the board understands the entity that it presides over so that when it has exercises its oversight role, that it does so with deep understanding. So a, a group chief executive comes into a meeting and say, um, um, Honorable Chair, I'm busy with an investigation. And then um, the new kids on the block started to use that word. Uh, only ask, who's we? And then the matter ends there. So is, is that what happened? I'm trying to... Um, summarize what you have just responded to. And uh, then I can know that uh, indeed um, we can't crucify you because you were just told I'm busy with an uh, investigation and you only ask uh, we or I and then said no, I. And then you did not bother to find out what investigation. Che, um, I reiterate that we yeah, so, so it, it was an Sorry. induction, so it's an induction workshop it's an opportunity for you to learn and ask more and understand things. Um, what investigation? Uh, what informs the investigation? Uh, when will it be concluded? Um, so in, in an induction workshop, uh, it, you are free to ask anything and uh, raise any question. There's no stupid question in an induction. It's intended uh, purely to get you to come to terms and be on the same level of the operations of EXCOM. So when that uh, presentation or report was raised, um, I'm pleased with an investigation. It ended there in an induction. Um, Chair, through you, um, just to bring it back to um, my fellow board member, had given context yesterday um, in terms of at what point. I don't think, um, and I can't speak for the mind of another person, whether Mr. Dereta had come into that induction process that we were busy with, with the intention to inform us, but it had been raised in the context of the matter of the questions that were asked around the call, the issue with the, the theft around there, and that, and then he mentioned that he is busy with an investigation. So we understood it in that context. So your next step would then be that once the investigation is concluded, that it would come to the audit committee. Do you want to add anything? No, thank you. So when was the meeting? Okay. Want to add and proceed? When was the meeting with Mr. Dereit after his interview? Uh, the actual date and time? I believe it was the 22nd of February. It was around midday on the 22nd. And you, you did not terminate his contract he offered um, to revert back to his original letter of resignation um, until End of February, that's correct. End of February. End of February. So, so from the day of your meeting until end of, end of February, he was still an employee of ESCOM. Um, and you have had an opportunity to listen, analyze, and engage with the content and the context of his interview. Um, at that time, until the end of his contract, you did not seek to ask for any record, any information to substantiate um, allegations made in the interview, seeing that you did not terminate his contract and he was still 
an employee of ESCOM. So you allowed him to continue to stay at home and you continued with your business as usual. You did not ask for any record, um, any information to be handed over to ESCOM. Did he refused to finish the board with such information or the board did not uh, deem it a fit or necessary to request any information. Um, through you, Chair, um, there is one component that we're not 100% certain of in terms of the chair of the board's interaction. Um, so we, I wouldn't want to, to confirm anything without first confirming with him. But having reviewed the, the interview, um, my understanding in terms of what Mr. DeRater said was that firstly, there's no mention of a report and no mention of an investigation. Um, the matters that he mentioned in, in relation to um, the crime, it had already been reported to um, law enforcement. The issues around corruption was already in the system and in terms of being dealt with um, or investigated internally with, within um, ESCOM. Matters were already sitting um, on the agenda of um, the Audit and Risk Committee. Um, I don't recall anything that one would further have interrogated with him other than the other stuff that he talked about. There are some speculations that would sit outside of the, the realm of um, what the board would, would, would have to deal with. Thank you. I think I can just want to provide a clarity on what you are asking, Honorable Latin, that in the submission of the chair of the board to parliament, that, he just, that we asked for. He writes, the board further resolved to release him forthwith from the obligation to serve the remainder of his notice period with immediate effect. Just wanted to expand on the question you were asking, which it was at that point. So the board further resolved to release him forthwith on the obligation to serve the remainder of his notice period with immediate effect. Yeah, that, that, that's what I wanted to get to, because I asked, the only thing you could think of is to terminate his contract with immediate effect um, in that meeting where the chair is referring to without asking for relevant information. <coughs> Yesterday and today were told no, he continued until end of February. So the chair painted a different picture, which was the resolution of the board. The board yesterday and today are giving us a different narrative, which is contrary to what the chair is saying. But the gist of the matter is to ascertain whether or not you have followed up the matter and requested relevant information. In his interview, he spoke about informants and the reports furnished to him based on the, the, their investigations. Now, once you have informants, you can't have informants without intelligence-driven operations in an interview. That uh, painted a picture of people um, washing their hands with 18-year-old expensive whiskey, um, dubious car washes. He did allude to informants and information furnished to him in the interview. Hence, I asked, having analyzed the interview, you did not deem it necessary to get all the relevant information in relation to the allegations. I'm sure by now you would have been privy to what was requested from him. Uh, you have been, at least by now, 
in in the board for more than six months, and at least uh, this matter has been dragging for some time. There has been statement back and forth, interviews, uh, statement issued by ESCOM. You should be by now in a position to know exactly what <coughs> actions were taken by the board, um, what information was furnished to the board, what is it that you have at your disposal and what is it that you do not have. Um, and I'm asking on those bases so that you assist us in, in our work. Because I find it, um, I don't want to say strange, um, that you wouldn't require information to assist you um, get into the bottom of the allegations which led to you terminating the contract with immediate effect. Uh, something triggered you to act immediately and you, one would have expected that at least certain information would have been requested from Mr. Dereit. Thank you, um, uh, through your chair. Um, I think firstly, just to um, cast our mind back to, to yesterday when um, Ms. Ghani was talking about the, the meeting that did play, take place with Head of Legal. Um, so the, the board did, of course, resolve that we need to um, look and make sure that we have um, that we've got all the information at our hand, that um, we've done everything from a board's perspective um, that we could have done, and um, the decision that we made at the time was that um, we will use um, independent um, investigator to look at our, uh, to make sure that we've looked at everything that we should have looked at. So that, of course, was um, very important to us that we haven't missed anything. Um, but once again, to, to come back to the decision that we've ma we made in terms of the parting of ways, I really do not want um, to create the impression that there was a one-dimensional decision. We were dealing with um, complexity at the time. It, it wasn't just one aspect of the interview uh, or the, the, the important fact that Mr. Director had made some utterances in the media having gone right past um, the board. So we definitely did um, this make the decision that we would get an independent, um, what, what is the right word, or investigator to look at um, whether the board had looked at everything. And that is in progress. Um, um, I'll, I'll let her speak to this question. Um, yeah, I just want to confirm, Chair, through, through you that uh, Ms. Governor did mention yesterday that the only uh, legal expert that has a forensics arm of this magnitude was ENS, and they've been engaged on this assignment. Um, and just to go back to what the chair of the board had said in terms of releasing him, I don't think we're saying something very different in terms of releasing him. You know, he, he, releasing meant he wasn't, to, you know, he was not coming into the office, but he was still an employee and treated as an employee until the end of the month. Um, you know, intact, uh, you know, uh, when we say immediate effect, it wasn't, he, he, was, he didn't stop being an employee at ESCOM on the 22nd. He just was not in the office from the 22nd. Thank you. Thank you. So did, did the head of legal offer her opinion on how you handled them of, of Mr. Tirator's um, termination of contract? And, and when was that? No, um, that's in the negative, so she did not offer her opinion. Okay. It was the first time we heard of it was yesterday. Thank you. All, all right. So w w when did you decide to get the information from Mr. Dereda through the independent um, legal firm? And why didn't you ask him, or let me ask differently, did you request him to hand over everything in, in his possession um, before the end of February? Indeed, Chair, through you, um, he was requested uh, to hand over all documentation and uh, company assets uh, on the 23rd of February, um, and yeah, 
so all company assets and, doc and should have been handed in on the 23rd. And do you know whether or not um, part of the documentation handed to you, um, so you, you are not privy to what he handed over no. to you? No, um, we can confirm that the report was not handed over. But you were specific? No, we were not specific. We asked for all. No, I'm saying yes, you were specific to say all yeah. the relevant information and assets and property of ESCOM must be handed back on the 23rd right. of February, and that did not happen. All right. So lastly, so how did you communicate your decision to ESCO about um, Mr. Director's exit? If it's in writing, do you still have a copy of such? I'm raising this precisely because there seem to be a different version and understanding of um, what transpired. Others say the services were terminated with immediate effect and you are saying he offered, so. Through your chair, um, when we made the decision, and I, I recall quite vividly that I was the one who said, we need to make sure that we speak to the executive before anything leaks. As you've already heard, um, Eskom is a very leaky place. We have learned that the hard way um, when we were still new kids on the block. Um, so we called a meeting with the executive um, to make sure that they hear firsthand um, from the board. There was no written um, correspondence. It was just a, a verbal communication. Before uh, anything would have gone out in, in writing, we wanted to have a meeting with the executive so that they could hear it directly from us. So there is something in writing? That would have been the announcement that would have been made. Can we get a copy of that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Sorry, just move this microphone. Okay, so yesterday and today we have dealt extensively with the issue of Andrew and his exit from from ESCOM. However, I mean since 2020, I think January 2020, we have had numerous engagements with ESCOM, with the then board, with Andre, with a number of people. And I'm afraid that I really do think that the whole narrative about when he left, why he left, etc., is being used as a very convenient red herring. I think it is being used to obscure the real issues that we should be looking at. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's extremely convenient. I mean, it's good and well to say he was bringing the company into disrepute. I still don't know how he could have been bringing the company into disrepute through that interview. I mean, most of what we've been hearing, we had heard before he handed in his notice. I mean, we had a meeting, I think it was last November in Cape Town, where he talked extensively about the issues at places like Tatupa. So, a lot of his information has largely been in the public space already. Um, when somebody starts raising alarm bells, to then say, no, he's bringing the company into disrepute, instead of actually listening to what is being said and investigating what is being said, I, I think is, is really trying to fudge the issue to an enormous extent. The allegations that we have heard over time, and I'm deliberately excluding what we've seen subsequently with the book. So I'm trying to limit this in time and place to before Mr. Dorejo exited. I, I think that, and I keep coming back to it, the apparent lack of interest, that's the impression that's created, in actually investigating some very, very serious things. It's good and well to say, well, you know, they were baseless allegations. I don't know how the board has only been in, in their position since the 1st of October. It's so glibly, as we were told yesterday, dismiss things as baseless allegations without apparently even looking into them. So the pattern repeats itself. People are leaving all the time. 
people on you when you were at Tutuka on Monday. I mean, there seems to be very little institutional knowledge. People have only been there three months, four months a year. A similar pattern seems to be unfolding here with people leaving after 18 months. There is a problem at ESCOM. There's an enormous problem at ESCOM, and I'm not hearing a sufficient, maybe it's bad communication, but I'm not hearing of a sufficient commitment to actually looking into these issues. There appears to be wholesale theft and corruption across the entire system that is so deeply embedded that it's almost as if there's a lack of will to tackle it. And I'm really, really concerned that it's easy to find a person to say, oh, they did this, they did that, they brought the company to this repute. But in fact, what should be happening is a remarkable focus should be brought to bear on the issues of ESCOM, on what is happening, on the theft, on the corruption, on the cabals, on supply management, on all sorts of things. And I'm really concerned that that appears not to be happening. SAPS is now here on board, and you know, we've heard from them. Nothing appears to be happening, and I'm rather worried that it's very much a case of fiddling while Rome burns. And I really want to hear from the board that there is a commitment to investigating issues that have been raised. Granted, it might not have been put in a perfect package, but if they're allegations, they can't just be dismissed. They actually have to be looked into. And that's the commitment that I'm looking for. Thank you. Through your chair, um, Honorable Van Minen, um, did I pronounce it correctly? Thank you. Um, I cannot agree with you more. Um, having come in, and I'll speak for myself as a board member, um, the only reason why I said yes, because uh, some people think they're absolutely insane, um, to come in onto the board of Eskom is because the country is burning. And I wouldn't want the next generation to inherit what we've created. So we've got to turn things around. We have to do it. So absolutely the commitment from our side is to clean house, to turn Eskom around. And when we say take it back to its former glory, it may not necessarily be in the same uh, form that it was in the past, but Eskom used to be amongst the best in the world. It was a good example of what South Africa is and can be. So for us, that is absolutely important that it needs to happen. We understand with absolute clarity that we need to investigate where we need to investigate. Um, we also understand with absolute clarity that we're dealing with great complexity um, and that we have to move as fast as we possibly can. So in terms of investigations where there needs to be investigations, those we believe are in place. Part of what we are doing, and I'll let the, the, the chair of ARC speak um, in terms of what is happening on ARC, but I can certainly say one of the questions that we've been asking is the capacity within ESCOM to investigate in all its facets. Because you, you have, when I say complexity, it's a combination of things that you're dealing with. Uh, often say it's like a perfect storm of fraud, corruption, crime, the whole, if you can think about it, you can find it. So how do we make sure that our people who have to help us clean the house are from a capacity perspective completely capacitated and you've got to have a combination of the competence and the number of people that you need. So that's all part of what we, um, that we are looking at. But there is absolutely no way that if you look at all the conversations and the meetings that we've had so far, that one can come to the conclusion that we are being complacent about it. Um, that is just unthinkable. Perhaps in terms of how we're communicating, we need to be a little clearer. Um, but I'm sure that you can appreciate that we walked into a storm. Within the first three months, we had a combination of 60 meetings. 
um, to just get our arms around everything. But certainly, um, if we need to compile a report for you so that you can see all the actions and what we've been talking about, what we're doing, what we've got in the pipeline, um, that I think we can furnish you with. Uh, but there is no doubt in my mind that you and I are on exactly the same page in terms of we've got to serve our people. Do you want to add? Okay. You know, I also took on this role as a career risk <laughs> because ESCOM can either make you or break you and I had a very flowery career as a CFO. Um, I'm very passionate about what I do because I want to leave something behind for my children. And I've never, I've never ever moved abroad because I'm so loyal to this country. You know, my generation, all the CAs left, they went to work for the banks in, in London. And I always stayed because I love being South African. And that's why I stayed, and this is why I now service the public sector. Um, ARC is very serious about what we do. It's very no-nonsense. It starts with cleaning ourselves up. And I want to say, I don't know, I, I appinged company secretary. I'm saying maybe we've had 20 meetings in the short stint that I've been here. Our calendar is one meeting a month, when it should have been four meetings a year. So the calendar is one meeting a month, but we meet on a Saturday morning, on a Sunday, whenever there's, if there's a pressing issue in terms of an allegation of a forensics nature, we don't wait for the calendar. We, we avail ourselves, we make sure we correlate, and we attend to the matter. And the matter is now into ARC cleaning its house. So when you look at what reports into ARC, which is the assurance and forensics function, we're even cleaning that up because there's speculation in terms of is it independent, are we getting the relevant information, is our whistleblowing hotline, is it credible enough for people to place reliance on it? That's the extent that we're now at. And we can go through, you know, the list of people that, you know, and allegations, but everything that comes on a Monday morning, I dread it. Because when I log onto my ESCOM laptop, I get all the allegations on my laptop from post nets and random allegations, you know, uh, people who don't want to disclose themselves. And every one of those are taken seriously by me. And so I can attest to my personal commitment in terms of cleaning up the house, because I think it will look like a different ESCOM, but it will be an ESCOM that will give the service delivery that's necessary to every South African, not just the privileged South African. And that's important. And if my role is not to physically connect a line, because that's not where my intellectual property lies, but my intellectual property lies in finance and, and, and what I do, then that's how I'm going to contribute. And that's my personal commitment. So, you know, I can only speak for myself in terms of that commitment. Thank you. Chair Three, I may, if I may just add um, just another thought. Um, I chair the Human Capital and Remuneration Committee. I do sit in ARC as well. So part of what we're wanting to ensure is that there's integrated thinking across the committees and, and that would, that the, the culture of the board will eventually filter through in the organization. What we also understand with absolute clarity besides our commitment is that ESCOM is going to be saved by ESCOM's employees, not the board. The board is only going to create an environment that would enable that. It is our people on the ground that will turn this organization around. So from a human capital perspective, what we're working on and what we want to see is a change in culture. You need a speak up culture. We need to deal with the fear in the system. We, we have to get to a point where our employees see that um, there is action within the organization because it's no good I raise my hand and I say something is wrong but nothing happens. Okay, so we, we look at it looking at it comprehensively. So it's not just about the criminals, it is also about the good people in our in our organization and may I add, I believe that they in the vast majority. Um, and we our job as the board is to, to bring about to make sure that we, we create that in an, an, an enabling environment. So the focus is from all aspects. So we're looking through all lenses to get to where we need to get to. <coughs> Chair, if I just may add something. Um, you know, we talk about ESCOM's former glory. I, I want to attest that when you look at an organization in terms of how it's been run, when you look at policies, procedures, documentation, ESCOM is still world class. You know, when you look at the documentation and, and, and those policies and the processes and standard operating procedures, and, and what you will 
you will see in most of the findings, it's really the human intervention that breaks it. And that's what we need to fix. Because yes, okay, there will be gaps in the system and we need to plug them because it's evolving and it's changing. But really the real breakdown comes in the implementation and the adherence to these policies and processes. And it's really related to the people. And that's what we really need to look at. Um, is it complacency? Is it performance? Is it, um, you know, uh, culture? Um, but again, you know, it's not, you know, we mustn't look at a complete organization and say it's burning because there's some things that work. And, and one of the things that I can attest to is when you look at how the standard operating procedures are drafted and, and their policies, they, they're in a good state. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that commitment. I mean, that is very good to hear. Just a couple of issues. You know, it's, we heard it yesterday when it comes to procurement, this whole issue of it's good and well to have these policies and procedures and SOPs, but certainly where we've been visiting with power stations, a concern is that it's almost like a really loosely put together federalized system. It's almost as if the power stations are all a law unto themselves. So there's, there's central ESCOM here, and everything is, is well-intentioned and put together. But when you're actually 200 kilometers away in some sort of, some of them more remote than others, in some remote space, it's almost as if the power stations operate as an island. And certainly some of the stuff I've seen regarding criminal activity seems to thrive on that basic isolation. So I am questioning how much um, direct control is actually able to be exercised on power stations in that regard, particularly when one talks about center-led rather than centralized. I mean, obviously, it's not our job to tell you how to structure the organization, but I do question the efficiency of that. Then talking about ESCOM's employees will save ESCOM. There has just been a wage negotiation, obviously, but it has not happened, the first one for several years. What was the cost of that, and is it going to add to the ESCOM debt? Now, no answers there have been forthcoming. The ESCOM debt is also a risk that has been discussed. So, and, and that affects all kinds of national financial issues. So, is it going to add to ESCOM debt? how long is this agreement deemed to be lasting? So there's that aspect. And then in terms of the group chief executive interviews, how is that progressing? That is also something that has been raised before. Um, because, you know, as you say, you are the board, you aren't the executive. One needs to be sure that the right people are in place in the executive who can do their jobs. And what we're seeing it appears that gaps are appearing all the time with people leaving, um, people saying, you know, they can't be effective in the organization. If you could just speak to those, thanks. Honorable um, I, I couldn't agree with you more in terms of is it centralized, decentralized, center-led. It's one of the risks that we, we talk about every once a month when we meet, if not more. Eskom has what's, and I'm going to be so passionate about this now because it's, 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 it's a bug, it's something that irritates me, if I can just use the word, because it annoys me because I need to get down to it. Um, and, and it was the previous C G CEO who actually quietened me down uh, because when I got here, I saw these very nice policies, procedures, and they held at an Eskom holding level. So when you go into the divisions and the implementation of it, it falls. You know, that's that's... And what they have is what we have is called a functional leader model. So you have your subject matter experts sitting at a holding company level, where HR will hold its, the policies and procedures and procurement in its what you call centre-led. But the actual execution is happening on the ground. And I question the effectiveness of it because that's where it's all falling apart. And we still question the effectiveness of it, and it's a, a takeaway for us. So. The previous GCO, Mr. Andrew told me, Fatima, you need to understand a functional leader model takes years for it to mature in an organization. So what you're looking for is actually something that will happen later on in time. You know, it's in its transition period. And I was a little bit patient, but I realized we don't have the luxury of patience in this organization because we need to push that implementation and adherence to it into the operations. 
and the opportunity is now arising, I believe this is my view, okay, that the opportunity is arising with this unbundling because you're going to have their own legal entities that are going to be doing the operations. So you're going to have your transmission business that's going to do transmission and there, those policies that were previously at a distance, you know, at the mothership, needs to be brought closer to home and clo you need strong, strong business partnering where if you have a finance person implementing a finance policy and people need to adhere to it, you need that strong business partner on the ground, a strong HR partner on the ground. And that's a great room for opportunity in this business in its turnaround. So we have that opportunity because we're going through a change and we must seize it. That's my view. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, to maybe just add, um, I think the, the complexities and the, and the unbundling is also one of those things that we, uh, we're spending quite a bit of amount of time in terms of application of mine because what we don't want is to find that later down the line, the decisions that, have, that, we, that are made now, that, it come, that they come back to bite us. When you talk centralized versus decentralized, both sides have got pros and cons. The question is, how do you mitigate against those risks? And, and that is part of what we, what we are dealing with. I'll, I'll ask the, um, the acting GCO to, to speak to the wage negotiation, the outcome of that. Um, we have not had a board meeting since that had happened. So the board itself had not yet had um, the, the privilege of its collective mind uh, being applied um, to it. But I think maybe just to, um, to, 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 to touch on one of the things that you talked about um, from a Human Capital and Remuneration Committee, one of the, um, the first things that we were really concerned about was the issue of leadership continuity, um, bench strength in the pipeline, because um, we, we're very concerned about the fact that when we look at the pipeline, succession is a, is a problem. Right? So if, a, if you get a vacancy, what happens? And my understanding is what has been revived, um, which I think we lost, and I, I speak we into the past, lost a little bit is the continual focus on making sure that we develop the leaders, that we identify the stars and make sure that we keep on developing that. That has now been revived, so, but that's the kind of thing that takes a little bit of time. But we definitely want to make sure that we increase leadership quality, that we increase the leadership continuity so that we can make sure, and leadership stability. Um, we came into a storm, we've got to get the executive into the eye of the storm and build the leadership capacity there. Um, I'll ask the acting GC. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Uh, with regard to the wage settlement, it's a three-year settlement uh, at 7%. Over and above that, there is uh, housing allowances that increases by 7% per annum. And then a once or for the first two years of a, a 10,000 rand amount to the bargaining units. Chair, we looked at the numbers in terms of our financial position, the liquidity and the cash flows that will be funded through the operations. And the main uh, contributing factor, if we look at where our staff complement is in our corporate plan uh, uh, and what was budgeted for and the actual amounts that are currently uh, permanent staff, uh, there's about a 2,500 uh, staff complement gap that is obviously not going to be filled overnight and that effectively that uh, complement uh, implementation that will be saved will be used to fund uh, the 7% the that was over and above what was allowed in the tariff of the 4.6% uh, increase. I think here over and above the numbers, wh what we believe as, as management, which is even more important, is the stability of the staff when we're dealing with the crisis, especially at the power stations. Uh, we, we can't afford to have an unsettled workforce. It takes a lot of time every year on an annual basis to negotiate with the unions. It takes time out of management. And it now allows us to focus 
on the real and the most important priority uh, for ESCOM and the country. Uh, and in getting to that agreement, uh, myself and uh, head of HR, Elsie Pule, we, we attended uh, that uh, conclusion of that negotiation. I also went around personally to, to thank all the unions in the manner in which we uh, got to the end of the negotiations and the agreement, which was the first time, uh, I think in about 13 years, we settled in the room. But my main uh, discussion with all the union members was, we've now got stability in terms of uh, the salaries and for the next three years, we now need to work together to deal with the number one priority for ESCOM, which is the stability in terms of the electricity supply and the load shedding. And, and with the momentum that we currently have, that is our big priority uh, in, in signing and making that agreement. I also believe uh, that the benefits you will get from the better performance of the generation fleet not only be, uh, will benefit ESCOM financially in terms of less diesel spend, but as we all appreciate from an economic perspective, the lower stages of load shedding and no load shedding during the day has positive ramifications from a GDP and economy perspective. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I was, I was just going to apologize to Honorable Van Minen through you. Um, the Chair of Art reminded me that my gray hair is real. Um, <laughs> uh, we are in the final stages. Um, the board has one meeting left. Um, we will then make a recommendation to, um, to DPE. And as soon as that's done, then we, the timelines on DPE side I can't commit to. Uh, but certainly from our side, we are hoping um, to have that sorted very soon. Um, as you can imagine, we wouldn't, the situation for us is becoming rather untenable. We, we worried about our acting GCE, <laughs> um, and um, that would also help in terms of bringing about stability. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, one certainly doesn't want the situation that we've seen as SCOPA, where people are acting for Several years. I mean, it, it really does become a, a very unfortunate situation. Just my, my last issue is the unbundling. Um, where is ESCOM on the issue of unbundling? Uh, we, we haven't really had a big update on that. If somebody could just speak to that and what potentially the timelines are. And, and just one thing, it, it might be an issue of not having load shedding during the day, but I've yet to see enough traffic lights in Johannesburg that actually work, so I don't really think that Johannesburg bothers to connect them anymore. Thanks. Uh, Chair, uh, Honorable Van on the unbundling of transmission, NTCSA, where we are, the, the key remaining uh, uh, requirements to operationalize the transmission unbundled entity is one, uh, we need the license from the regulator. Uh, feedback we've received that uh, probably by end of July that NERSA will make that decision on granting NTCSA the new transmission license. The other big remaining uh, requirement uh, is then the lender consent uh, that we're busy uh, in discussions with various lenders. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, we are looking at a, a timeline to achieve that lender consent by end of August. Um, I think those are the two big ones that are remaining. Um, there is, as, as, as a final hurdle, once we receive that, uh, there is an opportunity for all creditors if, if they want to uh, raise questions, they can uh, at, at the last hurdle, but we only can cross that uh, page once we get there. So. In terms of where we are and what we're targeting, well, we were targeting by end of November this year, but depending on some of these other outstanding items, uh, if the lender consent drags on a bit longer, uh, potentially it could move out slightly, but those are the two remaining uh, uh, 
requirements to operationalize transmission. I know Martin Base, the acting CFO, is, is closer to this. Chair, if you allow me, Martin, you want to add anything? Thanks. Uh, good morning, Chairman, and good morning, honorable members. No, I think the CFO has explained it quite well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. If we could just then also take up Dr. Van X's kind offer of a report on, on what has happened. That would be very constructive. Thank you. Honorable Mkonto. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, good morning, Chair, uh, honorable members, uh, board members, and the executive colleagues from the SIU and SAPS, and from Parliament. Chair, um, most of um, the questions that I had had already been um, uh, answered. But then I, I want to understand exactly am I getting it correctly? that the board has established or have started some in, uh, initiatives to get that um, a, 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 a private um, investigation report. Honorable Konto, I can confirm that your understanding is correct. Thank you. Um, coupled with those initiatives, um, I, 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 does the board interested in knowing the sponsors of that report? Because it's a millions of friends. There is no person or company that can sponsor such an initiative without any interest. So the initiatives that you have uh, uh, started of accessing that report, are you interested in knowing who are the sponsors of that report? Honorable Mukonto, um, we want to ensure that we have a full understanding that would include um, who is sponsored, who is investigated, um, so that we can apply our minds and take matters from there. Thank you. Chair, there is a team of technocrats um, that wrote to the president and the minister in November 2022, giving them um, some recommendations as to how can ESCOM uh, be turned around. I'm checking if the board is aware of that um, presentation. Honorable Mkonto, um, I am not able to confirm. Um, we probably need to confer with, with, to speak to our more technical people on the board, because there's been different presentations. Um, the one that you're speaking on, on in particular, I'm not sure about, so we would need to come back to you on that one. Thank you. Um, Chair, we, we, as we started day before yesterday, we, we are having um, officials and executives saying, no, I was not there, I've just joined, I was not here, I'm not aware, I have no knowledge, um, and, and so forth and so forth. Um, but my main, my main concern is whether um, it, it, it's good that the, the acting GCEO has already presented in, uh, in as far as human resources concerned. To me, it's sort of a turnaround uh, 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 strategy. But then, coupled with that, is the, are, are, are there any uh, intentions to fast track the disciplinary processes? Because um, if people are subjected to disciplinary processes, um, they, 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 they become dysfunctional. Are they, uh, in that turnaround strategy, are there any uh, uh, intentions of fast tracking the disciplinary processes, the, those that are suspended? Can their matters be finalized and, 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 and concluded? And can we be given timelines as to when is that going to happen? Because 
if that is not, those are not uh, executed, um, you will have a, a, even after filling in the vacant posts, you will also uh, 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 the morale of the staff uh, will not improve if you have a high number of uh, employees that are still subjected to. I'm not saying they mustn't be subjected, but I'm saying uh, that the, 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 those processes must be fast track. And then is that taken into consideration? Honorable Conto, I think that I can um, say to you that we are 100% on the same page. It is something that is of great concern to us as well. Um, so part of the, the questions that we had been asking is around um, the, 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 the long suspensions that we see, that we're very, very concerned about, um, the backlog that we saw when we came in, in terms of the, the disciplinary processes, um, and I'll ask our executive um, HR to, to just give us a little more clarity around that, and in particular in terms of what we're expecting in terms of timelines. Um, but from a board's perspective, we certainly do not want to see an organization where individuals are um, waiting for long periods of time for disciplinary processes, uh, for them to go through disciplinary processes, and certainly not um, having people on suspension for long periods of time. My understanding that uh, when it comes to the, those who are suspended, what is contributing um, to the long periods of time is the investigations and in, in some cases, but in any event, it's costing the organization from two perspectives. The one is that you are paying people who are sitting at home, but the bigger cost for me is not so much the money, but you've touched on it, the morale and what it says to the organization and, and the rest of the employees. So certainly high up in our agenda, um, it appears on more than one um, committee's agenda. It sits on Human Capital and Remuneration Committee. Um, the Audit Committee is also con concerns itself with it, as well as our Social and Ethics and Sustainability Committee. So I'll ask uh, Ms. Pule to just add to what I've said. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, honorary members. Um, uh, to respond to the matter around disciplinary actions, uh, what we have done as an organization uh, to make sure that we fast track the cases, we have um, focused on a multi-pronged strategy uh, in terms of ensuring that we build capacity for the case investigators. Uh, last year, we went out on tender as well. Uh, we also have a panel that also focuses on the high profile cases in terms of having highly experienced chairpersons sharing it uh, because one of the issues we had had was the quality of the investigations as well as the quality of the disciplinary processes where the criticism leveled against ESCOM was that the sanctions that were leveled against some of the employees did not match the misconduct. So I can assure the committee that from a, a, a disciplinary process a point of view, we have equipped our staff, the internal case presenters as well as chairpersons. We also have an external uh, tribunal based on the panel uh, to do that. What we also do in the three committees, committees that Mephon Eck has just raised, we report on a monthly basis in terms of how we're doing. Uh, just to give you an indication, employees who were on suspension with pay in December, we're about 42. Uh, at the end of this financial year, we're sitting at 31. We focus on that. We, we hold a mirror to business. We then do interventions where you have got employees who had been suspended with pay for more than 90 days. So we're tracking that and we're focusing um, a, a big on it. We have been running master classes with our managers uh, because your manager is key in terms of the disciplinary process to empower them in terms of IR processes as well as disciplinary processes. In terms of the timelines, in terms of how we're pushing this, our initial timeline was at the end of uh, March, the financial year. We wanted to have halved all the employees who were on suspension with pay, and we track it on an annual basis. So we don't have a current project plan, but we're focusing on the cases, particularly your high-profile cases and the long outstanding suspensions. 
I may just come in here. I think we also need to take a, a more overall look, and that's what the Human Capital Committee, and I'm going to speak for the chair here, so, uh, but it, it came from, uh, you know, it actually emerged from ARC. You know, when you look at the organization and its culture, um, you know, it could be that this entire disciplinary process is used as a tool in terms of management pulling employees into submission of what they want to be done. And the other way around, employees retaliating to employ, uh, managers when they are being performance, you know, managed on performance. And, and, and human capital has taken it as one of their objectives to look at how do we change the organizational dynamics so that doesn't occur, that really discipline, uh, disciplinary processes and uh, these things are really associated with the matters on hand and, and not against people. So it's not used as a tool of retaliation or as a tool of victimizing employees. Thank you. Chair, um, my last point is um, the culture of um, um, handing over um, responsibilities. Um, I think in this institution, it, 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 it has to start somewhere um, at the top. Hence, Chair, I want to ask the members of the board, was there any handing over? from the previous board. Um, it cannot be the previous board members themselves, but wa was there any a, 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 a crucial and critical information that when you came in as board members, you were given in as far as uh, this institution is concerned, specifically the activities of the former a, 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 a GCEO. The reason I'm asking this is because initially, it was like no one knew anything about that inv uh, private investigation uh, 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 process. But bit by bit, we are getting from the executives that no, he, he did mention it, but in passing. No, someone told me. No, someone else, but not him, told me. Uh, no, he, 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 he mentioned that, and it was not recorded. You see? Meaning that getting to the gist of this matter, um, we might find maybe in the lower ranks of this institution that indeed the former GCEO did introduce this and employees were interviewed and records were given to the private investigators. I'm not saying it did happen, but I'm checking uh, 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 your present, the presentations of ESCOM as we started, that the truth is coming very bit by bit, but uh, 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 coming to the light. But my question is, was there any handover activity from the ex-board members to yourselves as the new board members that took place? Through your chair, um, Honorable Mkonto, I think what you're raising is, is, is really fundamental in terms of an organization's overall culture. Um, and I spoke about leadership continuity earlier on, and for me that extends through to the board as well. We haven't had a formal handover that was extensive. During our induction uh, um, um, that we've mentioned earlier in a different context, the chair of the previous board um, did visit us and, and gave some of his thoughts. Um, I know that the chair of ARC, and I'll let her speak to it, she has had engagements with her um, counterpart from uh, the, the previous board. Um, but certainly one of the things that we want to make sure, that one would want to ensure going forward is that as you move from one board to the other, there, there is continuity. So unfortunately in this case, under normal circumstances, um, in any organization you would have, um, when, you, when, you, when you move from one board to the other, you don't would normally not have a everybody goes and a whole lot of new people come in. So generally speaking, you would have some people staying and some people rolling off. So there's always some continuity. I think that we probably, um, and I can't speak far in the past, um, but in this case, in terms of how we came in, it was a bit of an anomaly. And what could have been done better would have been a um, maybe a little more engagement. I'm not sure 
to what extent the, the previous board would have had conversations with us about a report. Um, when I remember the first, that was my first time with, with Scopa, um, in Cape Town, you had the previous chair um, of, the, of the board. And from what he said, the sense that I got was he was aware, but I didn't get the sense that the rest of the board members um, were as fully aware as he was. Um, so, but, to answer, but I think really going forward, um, that is something that is important in terms of making sure that when new board members come in, that there is that continuity. Thank you. I don't know if you want to add in terms of... Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you very much, Honorable Bukes, and then Honorable Liz, stand by, perhaps so you will round it off for us. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you to the members of the board. I think, Chair, uh, uh, we appreciate the, the commitment uh, of the board with the understanding that it is unusual in abnormal circumstances. And uh, one of you mentioned that ESCOM uh, is going to save by ESCOM's workers. Uh, I fully agree with that too, but uh, someone must give them hope. So my question to you is therefore, except for the visits where you, for example, a company, uh, members of the executive or a parliamentary committees uh, to, to the stations, to the power stations, did you ever visit the power stations as a board? And how often? Honorable Beakers, through you, Chair. Um, we have visited, but not as the full board together. Um, so the, um, the committee um, that, I, I call them the Committee of Engineers, <laughs> that is our BOPC, um, would have done more than we have. Um, I have personally been to three of the power stations. Um, as you can appreciate, as I mentioned earlier on, we've had an enormous amount of meetings. Um, the, the level of complexity that we've walked into, there's so many things that are happening simultaneously. Um, the organization has multiple things happening in parallel. The unbundling is one of them, so and there's lots of complexity there. Um, so we have not yet had the opportunity as a full board together, but we certainly have in groupings have uh, visited the, the various stations. Okay, thank you. Uh, what do you as the board think of uh, Mr. De Reiter's tenure as, as GCEO of ESCOM? Did he achieve these KPIs or do you think it was too challenging and, his, and him and his executive did not have the capacity to, to deal with the complex and the difficult situation? Sure, Honorable Beakers. A, a difficult question because at the time when um, the performance appraisal would have taken place, when the board would then would have really engaged in terms of Mr. De Reiter's performance, he did not give us the opportunity, he resigned. Um, so the, that is a difficult question to answer in terms of the collective mind of the board. Um, but in terms of the, the executive, I think that what we do need to take into consideration is that um, A, the executive living under very abnormal circumstances. One of the things that I've been very concerned about is crisis fatigue, um, you know, and, and also in terms of capacity is not just about level of competence, but whether you've got f enough hands on deck and whether all the hands on deck are at the level where they need to be um, under normal circumstances, but then you've got to add the crisis to it. So um, that's a, as, as far as I can, can go, but certainly we still need to, because we haven't gone through a full cycle. Um, you're sitting in situations at the moment where some people are acting, so I'm not, do I take um, uh, Mr. Kasim here in, in, in looking at his performance in the context of CFO or acting GCO? Um, so, it is, it is abnormal at this point in time, so it's not as straightforward an answer as I assume you would like it to be. Thank you. Uh, from our side as COPA, we engage and have oversight visits to ESCOM, 
and uh, we identified a lot of issues, weak uh, internal controls, weak financial controls, lack of consequence management, and non-compliance. And in most of the cases, to our disappointment, uh, it was not uh, addressed. I was asking the, the question yesterday that after your engagements with SCOPA, what happened? Was there any reflecting on what happened there? Because if we look or take some bits and pieces out of Mr. De Reiter's book, in one, one of the things he was saying that it's like, it was like a circus, it's like clowns and things like that. Did you ever reflect? after a meeting with, with uh, SCOPA, and uh, is there, how are you monitor the measures that you put in place to, uh, to address this uh, uh, weak controls in, 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 in consequence management and so forth? Chair, through you, um, I'll, allow, I'll ask the Chair of ARC to deal with the, the question around controls. Um, but just maybe more generally, um, yes, absolutely, whenever there has been an engagement with any of the parliamentary committees, uh, of course there's reflection. We want to make sure um, that we get to a point that you don't have to ask us the questions. Um, you know, so it is already integrated in, in, into what the board, through its various committees, are um, having oversight over that we are holding management accountable um, in terms of all the different aspects that we should. Everything that you've mentioned, consequence management and so forth, that's high on our agenda. Um, so whether it has been raised by you um, or not, it is in any event part of what we need to, what we're looking at as part of our mandate. Um, but in terms of the controls, I'll ask the Chair of our. Uh, thank you, uh, the Honorable Ms. Bukas. Um, you know, ESKIM uh, functions under the combined assurance model. And so what you're raising is exactly, you know, the auditors on a test because they do a sample basis have raised it in terms of the weak internal controls and their findings. And then we also have reliance in terms of the internal audit function, which is called assurance that reports directly into ARC. Um, all these findings go into what's called a tracker. And we have, so we know where there's a breakdown in internal controls we look at firstly, do we have a compensating measure in place? So um, if you refer to the previous annual report, you will see that the ARC report always says where there's a breakdown in controls, we've looked at compensating measures, are they sufficient, you know, can we place any reliance on them? But that doesn't sustain an organization, you need to fix that internal control. So what we've then done is we've put it into a tracker, we've got an owner to close it, and we've got a time frame in which it needs to be closed. And what I found when I first joined ESCOM is that you get these repeat findings because if something is found in one power station and implemented in the, that's power station, it can happen that it's not done in the next power station. So you've closed it in one, but you haven't really addressed it in the next one. So the, the other initiative we've done is, is we've said, if you find a finding in place A, make sure that that remedial measure is put through in B, C, D, and E, you know, so that it's uniformed in the organization. But certainly it's high up. It's something we look at all the time and it's high priority to ensure that, because if you don't have a sound controlled environment, you can't place reliance on information that's coming out of it, because it's susceptible. Um, so it's very important that that foundation is fixed and we take it quite seriously. Thank you. If I may just add through you, Chair, that um, the Chair of ARC had earlier on mentioned that when you look at what is documented in, in ESCOM, um, more often than not, it's sound but the breakdown often is people not adhering. So sometimes it is a matter of having to strengthen the control, um, but in many cases it is about the behavior of people around those controls. So if, if people don't adhere to the controls, the problem is not the control, the people, the, the issue is the, the, the discipline. So part of the conversation that we've been having, for example, with our internal assurance providers is when we're looking at when you see that breakdown, what is the root cause? 
And, and I think we, we, we're probably sitting with multiple root causes. In some cases, it may just be a lack of discipline and because you've, you've had poor leadership in terms of making sure that people adhere to the controls. In some cases, it may be a lack of training. In some cases, it may be an issue of I'm not adhering to the control because I'm afraid of somebody who wants me to not adhere to the control. So you've got to identify the root causes in order to deal with those issues. So that is also part of our, uh, our conversations, as, as the Chief Arc said, very high up on our agenda. Thank you, Chief. And I, I, just to end this point, you know, um, Dr. Von Eck alluded to an integrated approach of the board. You know, some arcs can be very dogmatic in just looking at a process and saying we need to implement. But the fact that I sit on the Human Capital Committee brings that humane element to say why. And let's look, is it a systemic problem? Is it a performance problem? Is it a training problem? Is it an organizational dynamics performance where I'm scared of my manager? It's the culture that we don't do things in a certain way. So when we look at really implementing these internal controls and getting them to be adhered to. It's not just from a finance perspective or a compliance perspective. It's really bringing in all the elements together and saying how do we fix ESCOM in its entirety. Thank you. As I was saying, I, I also asked the question yesterday of the reflections after a SCOPA meeting. And then the head of legal was saying she never attended the meeting to reflect after a SCOPA meeting. So is it only the board? or is it part of the executive? Yesterday I asked her, I was asking and she said that there was never a meeting, there was no meeting after a SCOPA meeting to reflect on what happened in, in, in the meeting. So is it only the board or is it the executive part of that meeting? Or because it's, it's now between now and yesterday. It's not even 48 hours. Thank you, Honorable Bukas. Um, I I cannot speak for the executive team, and I'll ask the acting GCO. So if, in t if you're asking whether so What we I'm asking is, is it only the board who are sitting to reflect, or is it the board plus the executive? Now, when, when, when the board reflects, uh, the board won't necessarily have the full executive team with us. So we have the acting GC. So under normal circumstances, the GCO and the GCFO, um, they are board members. Um, it culminates back into the committees to make sure that, that we keep an eye on everything. So if there's anything new that you have raised that is not already on our agenda, that is where the reflection would um, take place. In terms of what the head of legal was saying in relation to the executives, I I think that the, the acting GCO needs to respond to that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Bierkes. So what happens after a scope uh, uh, meetings? We would discuss the items, uh, especially to uh, our governance and regulatory uh, group exec, and then engage with the respective group executives if it affected their area. Um, Obviously, we take the learnings on board and as directions in the upcoming and, and, and quarterly reports or preparing for the next uh, EXCO, the executive committee will meet in terms of those submissions and have we dealt with and closed out the questions that were raised by, by SCOPA. So maybe uh, something we must take on board uh, uh, as per your advice, Honorable Bierkes, to have an actual meeting. Yes, we have one-on-one -on -one discussions with the respective group of executives that were impacted, but maybe not uh, a physical meeting as a exco that we all take back and, and look to implement. Thank you. Thank you. The other programs on the recommendations part of the performance assessment progress on the recommendations from us. Is it part of the uh, performance assessment of your executives, or are you doing performance assessments for them? Um, Honorable Bukas, through you, Chair, we have not yet been through that full cycle. Um, so, the, as I said earlier on, the, the GCE hasn't yet been, um, the, we didn't go through the appraisal because that didn't happen. 
um, we are still to go through the process um, in terms of what would come through reporting that would come through to, um, to the Human Capital and Remuneration Committee, but the actual executive's performance, that would um, sit with the acting GCE. Uh, Honorable Biakas, yes, uh, the, the group executive's performance will be uh, conducted by myself or previously Andre would have conducted that. Uh, with regard to your specific question, uh, does it get uh, adjusted in the compacts? The compacts are set at the beginning of the year and that's what's measured. Uh, again, uh, something we must take on board, uh, specific items that are raised by SCOPA, we should look then to amend and adjust in the performance compacts going forward, but we haven't done that in the past. I think it's something that you really must consider because we can't just sit and make rec recommendations and it's not implemented because there's nothing that, uh, for example, uh, uh, that add to the performance or so. So, uh, Chair, uh, I think my, yes, I have two questions left. What are your views on the effectiveness of the security currently in ESCOM? Can we have some clarity, um, Honorable, because when you say security, is it physical security, cyber security? What? Honorable Birkers, I'm not sure that at this point in time we would be able to give you a good sense because we are still in the process of reviewing. So um, security for us is, is one of the, the legs of that overall um, looking at crime, corruption and so forth. That's, it's, it's one leg of what we're looking at. So what we have been asking, what we've asked for is to have that overview so that we can see what is covered, what is not yet covered, where are the gaps so that we can ensure that those, those gaps are, are plugged. Um, so at this point in time, to be able to say to you we're 100% happy or 80% happy would be a, a little difficult. Um, I would say that it, for us, at least for me, discomfort that we, we haven't yet been given a picture where we see the whole picture you're seeing components and to bring all of that together. So that is something that we have asked through um, ARC, uh, asked if the Chief of ARC wants to add anything, uh, the GCO wants to add. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Biakas. So I had my first meeting with the Priority uh, Committee Generals about two weeks ago. Uh, open discussion just around the six months or seven months working with ESCA much closer around security. Uh, the feedback I received from the generals was extremely concerning as to your question, as to the status uh, and our ability to protect uh, the infrastructure of ESCOM, not only the physical uh, infrastructure, but also from a, a cyber security perspective and an information perspective. And in my discussion with that committee, and in particular General Jacobs, uh, my, my uh, agreement was to him was uh, I will arrange for the EXCO to have a session with that priority committee. And in the same feedback he's given me to give it to the EXCO, uh, I can relay the message, but I'm not going to do justice when it comes from the generals uh, in particular. I've also mentioned this to the ARC chair that I, I believe it's important that the ARC committee dealing with risks should also get that briefing from the priority committee. So Honorable Birkus, I think from, from 
what I heard, I'm really concerned, uh, and, and it's something that uh, needs to be explained to both the EXCO and the ARC, and in the interventions, how we work together with the priority committee to address the security control environment for ESCOM's assets, uh, uh, physical as well as from an information and cyber perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my last question, Chair, is the, uh, in one of our meetings, we hear that the head uh, of security uh, became in, uh, aware of the involvement of the private company in September 2022. So the board only hear about it in January, to be exact, the 17th of January at a dinner. So did he or she at any stage brief you about it or tell you? And I'm not sure if anyone asked it already. You still not have the intelligence report. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Birkus, through your chair. Um, no, the head of security did not um, inform us, so we didn't get anything from her. Um, and just to reiterate, at the time in January, we didn't know that there was an intelligence report, so or the, um, it was the mention of the investigation. Um, so we, we, so what was the last question? Something else again. Yeah. Oh, the report, yeah, no, we definitely don't have the report. It has been requested. We have still not been furnished with it. From who? SIU and BLSA and fathers themselves. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> right, uh, Honorable Liz. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Good morning to everyone and welcome back, Fatima. <laughs> and, um, this, I assume the Auditor General was a. <laughs> And indeed, um, the commitment of both you and Kuladel to the cause is, is quite evident. Um, I, I have a son who is a CA, and he's married to a CA. And, uh, and it is my daughter-in-law who keeps saying, London is calling. And I say, but you guys are so well-placed here as CAs. Fantastic jobs, and they really are a CFO and so on. Um, and my daughter in says, Dad, what about your grandchildren? What is their future? And I keep, as a good South African politician, promoting the future of South Africa. But your commitment is valued. Thank you. However, let me just say this, and we've had just had a little comment about this so-called intelligence report. The fact is that the SIU do have it. And as I said yesterday, the fact is that the media do have it. I would have thought that you as the board would have by now delegated Caleb, someone on the board, make an appointment to go and see George Fivers and say, right, let's sit down now and let us get this report and let's work with you, George. No matter what his history is, we're going to fix Eskim. Let's work with you and see now what we can be doing getting out of this. Has that not happened? Are we just sending out a memo to, I think you quoted three sources that you'd asked for. Surely there's more urgency than that. Honorable Lise, um, absolutely agree with you. And I'll just ask the acting GC to just inform you in terms of, because I know that you've had more, more than just the memo that has been sent out. But, but the request did come from ARC for the report specifically. So ARC has requested the DCEO and tasked him. Your commitment is great, Fatima. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Honorable Lise, uh, I did have a discussion with uh, SIU as well as B BLSA. Uh, George Fivers, no, I haven't had a discussion with, with him as yet. Thanks. And, uh, but we have requested it. Uh, as uh, Head of Legal has also indicated. Uh, I'm waiting feedback from SIU as well as BLSA. Shall I give you a copy? 
um, I, I'm not in a position to do so, but I'm saying that's really, it's, it's, it's not so much getting the copy, it's the contents that really should be an urgency. And, and I know I hear about, we hear about all the good work you're doing with systems, processes, and so on, but they're not going to solve the problem. It is not. As I said yesterday, it's a people problem. And indeed, when I hear you talking, you keep coming back to discipline and so on. So, Eskim is a bankrupt company. Don't try and tell me it's not because the sovereign is taking your debt away. It's a bankrupt company. It doesn't make a profit. It's shutting down sources of its manufacture manufactures electricity, that's its product. You're shutting them down. So you're downsizing your organization. But your number of employees, as, as I understand it, and you can correct me, but it's certainly gone up dramatically and I think almost doubled over the last 15 years, specifically during the state capture period. And so South Africans look at you and they say, they can't produce electricity. They're selling it at hugely high prices now compared to where we were a few years ago. And yet you give this bloated staff compliment a 7% increase. Your staff compliment should be saying, hang on, we're in trouble here. We've got to protect our jobs. We'll take a decrease in salary. This company is bankrupt. And yet we give them a 7% increase because we want to keep them happy. They should be saying, we want to keep our jobs. How do we do that? And I don't hear that coming through, I'm afraid. It is the very people, and you guys are saying it, who are not implementing systems, who are part of the corruption and fraud. Not all of them. I think you have how many? Thousands? 10, 27,000 or something? Employees? You can't possibly have all of them and are bad, the majority are good. Whether the majority are actually performing a function that is useful to the production of electricity, I would question. I look at this place around me here, this ivory tower. It's massive. What do all these people do? Is it full of people? I looked at the garages I drove in this morning and there are very few cars in it, but perhaps your employees come to work later than we came in this morning. Or maybe they're working from home. But my point really is, Caleb, is it's all very well to say that you've had a smooth negotiation. Of course you will. You've got highly paid staff. They've been given a 7% increase. They must be saying, ha, 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 this is lovely. Thank you very much. It's tough running a business. It's very tough. I happen to have run pretty big corporations in my time. There is no easy way of dealing with people. There is no easy way. You, I'm being difficult. I'm a grumpy old man, my wife tells me. Frequently. Um, and I probably am. But it's tough. Your business is in big, big trouble. Your employees should be there to make it work or leave. That's the bottom line. So I, it's more of a comment. I'm afraid I was prompted by your, your, your picture of this well-being of people and smooth meetings. Let me tell you that my history is not as well known probably, but the company I was an executive in in 1983 was the first company to recognize a trade union in Northern Cape. KZN or Northern Natal as it was then. I had negotiated with trade unions from the very start of trade unions being legalized in South Africa. It's hard. It's not easy. But in the end, we do a deal that's beneficial to everyone, not just one or the other side. And quite honestly, I think South Africans are looking at ESCOM right now and saying, goodness me, how can the taxpayer effectively give a 7% increase to a bloated staff complement who are paid more than market values anyway, in many cases, most cases I think, and, 
And they're saying, but we can't even get electricity out of this company. So it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a comment, I'm afraid, Mr. Chairman, but um, I hope that there is action being taken to downsize your staff complement in line with the needs of the company and that you're not simply moving ahead with the same staff complement. You say you've got 2,500 vacancies. Well, don't fill them. Critical vacancies have to be filled. My understanding is that your company is very short of skilled people at the coalface. Uh, that's probably the wrong term to use, but um, uh, it, uh, that, that, that is something you have to address and should be addressing. So what is the progress being made to encourage people to, who have left the organization, who have the necessary skills, to come back irrespective of their physical appearance? Mr. Chairman, that's the one question out, out of that. And then in terms of the, the unbundling, I mean, the, de the, debt, the debt burden, the sovereign has taken over part of it, but the, the, the remaining debt burden, where is it going to land up? Is it going to land up? Transmission is the one division or company which can be profitable right now, as I understand it. I haven't looked deeply into your books. I'm only a bookkeeper, not a CA like Fatima and my son and daughter-in-law. Um, but where is this debt burden going to land up at the end? What is the proposed um, place? Because if I was a lender, I would be very, very cautious about this because I don't think the, the – um, you have – I know you have massive government guarantees on, on debt, but not covering everything. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's see what we get. Okay, thank you, Mr. Let's get a response to that question riddle statement. Yes. Uh, thanks. We have a good relationship here, sir. We are rude to each other, but we go out and we give each other. Just putting your leg because you give the – it's more of a comment, and then you'd pop a question. <laughs> so, right, but I think yeah. the important questions there, and let's yeah. get responses. Thanks, thanks, Honorable Lisa. Uh, I fully agree that uh, in terms of ESCOM meeting its debt obligations, we can't do it without the government's support. Uh, uh, in the last few years, we've had the equity injections of billions of rands. Now we've got the debt relief. Again, it's significant amount of taxpayers' money. But I think we must also have an appreciation of over and above the poor generation performance in EAF, which we are clearly focusing and, it, and we need to rectify as quick as possible uh, as per our targets to get to 65% EAF at the end of this year and 70% at the end of next year. There are two other elements we must not forget. We have 60 billion rand of municipal debt that is due to us. That makes a big difference in liquidity. It's not going to get us out of the 400 billion rand uh, debt on, on the books at the moment, but it is an important element, and that needs to be resolved uh, at a government level. And the other one is in terms of the regulatory mechanism and the recovery of the efficient costs. Over and above the operating costs, if we look at the returns that the regulator allows to ESCOM uh, in their determinations, it's sitting at a 1% return on a revalued asset base. And I think at the end of the day, uh, if through the regulatory mechanism, uh, we can't cover that financing costs, it creates a problem and effectively it leads to government stepping in uh, to support us in terms of, what, 75% of our debt that is guaranteed. So, yes, we do agree that, uh, I mean, being the CFO of ESCOM now with the acting, or I think end of July will be six years, never reported a profit. Uh, billions of rands of losses. Uh, anything between uh, 10 to 20, 25 billion. So I feel the pain, uh, Honorable Lise. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think the reality is this. Uh, a 2% change in a salary or 3% is not going to get you out 
of a 20 billion gap on your bottom line. You need to drop the debt. The debt service cover is just unsustainable. Uh, and secondly, let's also agree we need to improve our operations and spend less on diesel. Uh, and then last but not least, collect what is from, from, from the municipalities. Uh, honorable lease, I think, over and above the salaries uh, in the last, what, six years, I know I've not signed off. There's been no short-term incentive for any staff in ESCOM. We have reduced the headcount over the last uh, three years. At the ESCOM level, I think we're sitting at about 35,000, and if we add the subsidiaries, we're at uh, 40,000. So we do look to, to optimize that. Maybe last but not least, uh, I think on, on the unbundling and uh, where will the debt sit, Martin can add to this in more detail, but effectively we split the debt uh, according to uh, where it was raised and substantially in the generation business. And then for all the debt that was raised on a portfolio basis, it was split on uh, the proportion of capital expenditure that was incurred historically. So from a transmission perspective, Martin, correct me, I think the total debt out of the 400 about, is it uh, 40 billion goes to transmission, so about 10%. Fundamentally, uh, most of that debt is going to remain in the generation business. So we do believe that on a transmission perspective going forward, it'll have a couple capital structure that's much more sustainable, obviously taking into account the debt relief as well. We need to account for that. And then we need to make sure that the revenue streams going forward from trans transmission is enough to service the debt and to generate the profits so we don't repeat the mistakes that what's sitting at our, the current consolidated picture. So yes, uh, we do see transmission being sustainable on its own balance sheet going forward. I think similarly, if you can deal with it, it's easier said than done on the distribution side, if you can improve some of the collections on distributions. Uh, that also doesn't have a lot of debt, I think around 30 billion debt. The real problem is generation, which you're not gonna fix overnight, together with the performance and that significant debt. That will take lo longer to become sustainable, but I, I think as a positive from an industry perspective, you can make NTCSA sustainable on its own feet. What do you want to add to you, Honorable Chair? Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Caleb. Yeah, I think what we must also understand is that while we've allocated the debt to the three entities, being generation, distribution, and transmission, we did it through intercompany accounts. So the debt will remain with ESCOM Holdings, the external debt. And the reason for that is it is easy to allocate specific debt. For instance, if there is a project to fund a specific asset, you can allocate that. But then you've got the general pool of funding. And how do you allocate the general pool of funding? Because that is your ESCOM bonds and all those type of things. So the, the decision was we will keep all the loans with ESCOM Holdings, but we will have intercompany loan accounts. Uh, on, the, on the method as Caleb has explained, how we've allocated to the three different entities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mabulis. Uh, Mabusam, um, yeah? Well, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, a good morning to um, the members of the, of the board. And, and the executive. Um, well, well, thanks so far for, for, for the responses that we have received on, on uh, critical matters um, uh, of uh, sustaining uh, ESCOM. Um, we've, we've heard a number of uh, uh, things since we have been here, probably since we've started this kind of a process. Um, one, uh, what, what strikes me uh, as a start is, is, is the fact that you sought critical clarity uh, on, a, on a matter which uh, was somewhat raised with yourselves. When you said um, the former GCO 
um, so he, he is uh, uh, busy with some investigation. And, and uh, seemingly when, when he started that introduction, started by we are, and then you sought clarity who is we. And, and uh, the in affirmation, uh, he, he said I, uh, which, which means it's himself. So, so what, what's, what's your view uh, uh, about the, the context uh, of a finalized uh, report after that session? Honorable Samia, I, I hope that I'm understanding the, the question correctly. Um, I think it's, it's difficult to have a view until we've actually seen the report because everything for us at this point in time is a matter of connecting dots. You know, so you hear an Andre saying to the board, um, I am busy with an investigation. Because you don't have context when it is said to you, um, it, is, it is something that you then assume as part of the normal processes within the organization, and you would expect investigations um, to, to be conducted within the, within the organization. So to connect that to the report and what the report is telling us and then glance back at what we were told, we can't do that because we, we still don't have 100% of the, the full picture, and, and we'll only really hope, for, I'm hoping, um, that we will have that once we, we've, we've been able to come through that report. The reality is, up until now, our experience has been that much of the information we've been getting through the media, and not through what one would expect to be the channels within the organization. And, and I'm saying that to just qualify, that I may, we may not still be in a position, we may find, five months after we've come through the report, boom, there's something else. Um, just because our experience up until now is that um, it's a little bit, it feels like cloaks and daggers. I hope I'm answering your question. But, um, Honorable Somia, just to come in, the context of the I and the we on the investigation was around the call and the call mismanagement. So if you're looking at it through that lens, you would think <coughs> if there was a report, it would relate only to the call and the call mismanagement. We didn't <coughs> Nothing was alluded to in terms of the broader scoping of the investigation. Yes, um, I'm, I'm saying that, that 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 was a very important question uh, because here you are, you are embodiment of this uh, kind of an institution, and and. Um, uh, th then you have someone who has that indication, owns to it, uh, and, and um, uh, proudly saying, I, I am conducting that investigation. So, so, so uh, in, in that way, in affirmation with that, uh, that's my investigation. So, so I own up into it, and I own up into the the, the finalization of it, I own up into the processes, I own up into uh, the, the outcome, the matters, what, whatever is, is there. So in that context, uh, frame uh, your, your actual reaction and probably your intention uh, into getting into what is actually um, uh, the, 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 the content uh, of that kind of report. Is that my understanding uh, correct as it refers to yourselves? Once again, um, Honorable Samia, I hope that I followed you um, correctly. But yes, so when, especially when a CEO says I, you, 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 you're taking that as in terms of the head of the organization and an I is also a royal we. So, um, that our understanding is exactly um, as we've explained it. Okay. So, so your royal we begins to be part of uh, that kind 
uh, of a of the outcome um, uh, in a way so so uh, as part of the institution then uh, because it's your CEO um, uh, involved in such processes so so the outcome would be your outcome that was what one would expect, yes. And, and then if that is the case, you would have an interest into it, and, and, and therefore you would want to follow that kind of an outcome. Absolutely, we would have an interest. But up to now, you don't have that support. Despite our efforts, no, we still don't have it. Don't you think that, uh, therefore, is a, is a delayed um, a way uh, of getting into that, that kind of ownership, that if it's yours, it's ours, and uh, if it's ours, then we're failed to uh, somewhat follow through uh, in terms of that ownership. So again, if I may come in, Shire, the I and the we time of the report was built around the context of the cold mismanagement, which we then we viewed it as an ESCOM investigation that would eventually turn up through the normal channels that will come through ARC and then come to the board. If you look at the timing from January to when um, this thing went viral, it was February, and the board, I, I'm not even sure when we became aware that there was an actual FIVERS report, but the name of FIVERS report, much later. So from the time of the IV report, uh, the IV uh, investigation, the, the scoping of what is today a FIVERS report was unknown to the board. We would not have known that there is a report that extends with such a large scope. In, uh, what we know today is coming largely from the bits and pieces that we're getting out in the media. Okay. Now, it's, um, I was just going to agree with, with the chair of ARC and, and then maybe just add, when we did become aware of the full scope and understand and understood that all of this was run outside of ESCOM's normal, or within, with outside of its normal structures, that we had resolved that we need to get a copy of that report so that we can look at the report and make a judgment call in terms of what do we need to take from the report and what actions need to be taken by ESCOM um, from the, and, uh, in terms of looking at through the board's lens. I hope I'm answering your question. No, no, th thank you. Th thank you, uh, uh, Doug. Um, you, you are brought in into an environment uh, which, which has been very toxic. Um, I take it you have confirmed it, and that you have had to deal with a number of things within that toxic environment. And uh, we have had a number of things as well, which uh, are somewhat uh, closer to such. And, and um, that's why I have accepted the point that you have made, that you, you never run through a handover, a normal handover situation. Uh, because the previous board was uh, just terminated and, and therefore brought in, um, uh, in a sense, and, and uh, therefore there was no actual normal uh, environment for some of the things to happen the way they ought to uh, somewhat uh, happen. Here we are, we went to Tutuka. Um, and we've heard a number of things about Tutuka yesterday. When, when we were there, um, well, I want to, want to say uh, from my own observation, I was very much encouraged um, when there was an indication that things are turning around. And um, as part of that turning around, there is a responsive, uh, positive, uh, instance which confirms what you said this morning about getting into your personnel uh, workforce who are committed into doing that kind of work. Uh, you know, one of the things which were given there uh, in terms of the presentation 
was an aspiration uh, of, of management of that uh, power station. And, and uh, within such, they outlined their priorities. I think it's about uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten priorities. And, and uh, they, they, they start with becoming a high-performing station and end uh, by zero, zero tolerance uh, of uh, corruption. So, so, so all those priorities, are you aware of those priorities? Do you buy into such priorities? Are you committed into uh, such priorities? Honorable Somia, Somia, I unfortunately was not with you um, on, the, on the 19th, um, but the two that you've mentioned, so I don't know off the top of my head what's the rest on the list, but certainly the two that you've mentioned is absolutely high on our priority. Um, high performance culture, um, and we've added to say a high performance ethical culture, um, which then encompass both those that you have mentioned, certainly very high up on the Human Capital and Remuneration Committee, which I chair, um, but that follows through the various committees right up to, to the board. Absolutely um, very committed to that. That is exactly, we believe that in order for us to, to turn the organization around, you can't turn the organization around without turning the culture around and the high performance and ethics. And for me, I should also say that when we're talking about ethical, it's not just about fraud and corruption. Those are very important. But it is also the broader ethical issues. So you, you've got to, if you think about ESCOM, for example, the environmental issues, um, how we treat our people, um, and so forth. So ethics for us is very broad, and you want to make sure that you have the combination of the two and in focusing on your, your culture turnaround. Mm -hmm. and, and then that, that followed with what I, I indicated yesterday uh, as, as, as part uh, of uh, some interventions uh, in getting into uh, bringing back functionality uh, of, the, uh, of the plants uh, uh, which, are, which are making the performance uh, very uh, effective there, indicative of what has been rated as percentage uh, form or on the EAF uh, uh, indicators, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, uh, one of those uh, uh, areas is the area that uh, uh, relates to uh, getting back the actual uh, shutdown uh, sections, which have been broken down into projects. And, and uh, thinking of getting them back, uh, you see, uh, from uh, actual operation uh, in as far as the plant is concerned. The, 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 the group executive indicated that he hasn't brought that part into the board yet, but that's a, an area which he has started to work on uh, in a positive instance uh, to ensure that that plant, that uh, power station, improves its own functionality. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Honourable Somnio. Um, so I think one of the important things that um, I would like to highlight is what the board had done in terms of how we're organising ourselves um, to ensure that we have oversight over the various areas is to create the BOPC so that but I referred to earlier on as the Committee of Engineers, um, to ensure that when we're looking at performance, that there is that close and deep conversations, because as you can imagine, board meetings, we've got to deal with so much in board meetings and you've got limited time. Your, your real debate and application of, deep application of mind on the various issues happen within the committees. So I would assume what the group executive had mentioned to you, that would go to the BOP, BOPC, the engineers would engage with that and they will then bring it um, to the board. Um, so I look forward to hearing about that as well. But absolutely, um, as I said, the way we've organized ourselves was to make sure that the board is able to, to drive from our perspective, to ensure that the performance is there. 
I, I'm, I'm searching all those kinds of things to appreciate um, that uh, here is the station which, which has been cited as a bad performing station, red lined, nothing good that is taking place, and uh, things are, are somewhat uh, Im Im improving. And we are there as a board. The chair of the board was there. Uh, he made affirmative stations as, as, as statements uh, in as far as uh, uh, the areas of uh, commitment by the board in terms of performance. You would uh, somewhat do the same uh, in terms of your analogy uh, per station to show that these kinds of things have revisited uh, somewhat uh, in as far as such performance is concerned. But the contribution is positive to the grid. Uh, uh, you see, in as far as what we are experiencing as communities out there in terms of load shedding. And, and uh, I think what is Honorable Lewis has referred to uh, in as far as a, uh, the, the, the death uh, of, your own, of your own operations uh, are um, looking into uh, the actual contribution uh, into your financial capability and, and uh, something which then brings that hope ought to be not only celebrated, it ought to be uh, uh, repeated somewhere else. Absolutely agree with you. Uh, so um, what we do keep on driving for is to make sure that we have that ripple effect throughout the whole of the, the organization. Um, it's, it's a pity that the chair of BOPC is not here. Um, I think it would have been great if you, if you could hear directly from that committee. Um, but the way the committee has been working is we, we've got the, the key ones that we know these ones we need to bring up, um, but then also categorizing the various stations into groupings, um, and what attention is needed. And the attention, once again, come back to that integrated thinking, because you, you've got a combination of factors. There's the, um, the engineering side of things, but then there's also the controls side of things. Um, and we've also made sure that, and you could have, you heard her saying she sits on my committee, I sit on her committee, so that there is that cross conversation that takes place so that we can make sure that we've got an eye on, on all the different components. Hmm. One thing which has been uh, on site um, through our own visitations here, discussions with executives uh, for quite a number of um, engagements that I've had was uh, contract management. And, and um, which, which has been an aspect which is a bit riskier uh, uh, in as far as getting into your own inputs um, and at times resulted into your breakages, looking to matters of coal uh, and so forth. And, and that would have somewhat counted towards managerial uh, responsibility. Uh, uh, if you agree with me that if there's a problem in terms of coal and uh, the half track is stores, uh, the half track is uh, the coal, it means that your actual management capability is under test, uh, you see, for the coal that gets into each and every uh, operating, operating plant causing breakages uh, 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 in a way. And, and therefore, the linkage between administrative function and the actual uh, policing, security, criminal element. Because your responsibility is to ensure that ESCOM produces energy. Uh, you see, and, and you have uh, those who fight crime to work together with yourselves uh, to deal with chasing thieves and uh, deal with matters that relate uh, to those who ought to be apprehended uh, who are destructive in terms of the operations uh, in as far as your productive levels are concerned. Fully agree. There's a whole ecosystem. And on the matter of contracts, also something that we have also had extensive discussions, and I'll ask the, uh, the chair of ARC to just speak to that, because there are concerns for us there. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Somio, coal is a business study in itself. It's, it's, it's a whole value chain from end to end, you know. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a key input in terms of the output. Um, but when you actually look from the coal production to the quality and quantity that makes it into the plant and the implications thereof to the output, 
um, it is a whole value chain that warrants uh, a review, you know, um, because it's the suppliers, the quality that you're getting from the supplier, our way bridges working, are we storing the coal correctly, are we utilizing them within a stock turning cycle or are they long outstanding on site, how are we accounting for them, um, what goes into the plant, is it stones that's going to cause something to, you know, break down and then the quality of the coal that goes in versus what the quality that comes out in the form of energy. So coal in itself, that entire value, you know, that entire value chain warrants a review, you know, because if you want to, imp if you really look at a low hanging, I don't want to say low hanging fruit because it's not as easy, but if you really want to look at changing the needle and that dynamics and you just zone in on that value proposition, you can actually make a fundamental difference in a positive way, you. you know? So mm -hmm. I think that's, 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 that's just something I, I want to say and it's, it's definitely not off our radar. Mm -hmm. In terms of contract management, I can tell you that not just you, um, uh, what is it, anonymously, but even through the organization, through the board, you know, the ARC, one of the things that is continuously coming to us is please look at this contract. It may have been signed way back when, but you know, is it relevant now? Can you look at the conduct of the supplier? Um, is there a red flag? Can you make an assessment? Is there a red flag? So really one of the uh, scopings that ARC has now extended to is really just looking at contract management. Mm -hmm. Because there are contracts that we're executing on today that were signed on way back when. Is it relevant? Is it beneficial? Um, can we get out of it? How do we renegotiate it? So those are also initiatives that we're thinking of. Because when it's, it's, the, it's another dimension to the organization. Coal is really an input versus output, but contract is a, is a leg of the business that you can also change it fundamentally if you just zone in on those important main contracts and say, let's look at what we can do differently here. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm raising it as a, as a matter of uh, significance uh, that your operation uh, gets support through a number of contracts which we have signed with a number of uh, service providers. And if you uh, somewhat get into it uh, in terms of your analysis, and you'd find out that major critical problems reside at that point. But, but uh, if your managerial uh, performance is not into it, it then becomes a, a reverse mechanism uh, in terms of your actual um, objective and aspirations. Uh, uh, you see, so it becomes so critical that you begin a nature of uh, dealing, uh, dealing with it. If you look into your, your contractual, uh, uh, what I would want to uh, deem uh, throughout the years, um, maybe probably in your existence, that has led into existence of a, a long-term contracts, which at times, once they get to used into the system, they as well uh, sink the system break the system uh, for their own uh, existence in a long term. Uh, you know, so so your, your, if your management is not tailored uh, around uh, such uh, in terms of your revenue stream and uh, in terms of your actual expenditure, and, and uh, those kinds of things are going to impact uh, even on the income and the actual sustainability uh, of the uh, uh, of ESCOM uh, going uh, Going, going forward. My, my last comment, uh, Chair, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an area uh, which uh, uh, they, they have uh, uh, looked, looked into. This uh, culture, I'm going to use Tutuga as a, as a, as a point of reference, uh, because it really looks like that there's been not a singular area of focus, a number of areas just to break uh, the, uh, the, the model of performance which has been negative uh, in, that, uh, uh, in, that, in that area. Whether you look into personnel, uh, the same practice has been somewhat the same. That there are somewhat a change which has been experienced uh, to those who lead into uh, uh, that kind of an institution. And that what has been the benefit out of that change as we have been told, but as we have somewhat uh, have been advised in terms of the picking of uh, the EAF, which is an indicator of what ESCOM should do, uh, that will remain 
celebrating if there is improvement uh, of uh, uh, the EAF at all times and will run on you, on your neck, if uh, that uh, uh, turns down. Because we want to change uh, the things uh, in terms of negativity uh, going out there. So we're not on you because uh, we only see the negative things or we are carriers of negativity. But we need to appreciate where there is some form of a positive uh, lines of performance. And, and uh, we are lucky because it then happens on your time. Uh, you see, and to sustain that, it needs your commitment to look into things that are somewhat uh, uh, improving. In the news, we're told that we are going to approach the blackout uh, in winter, and uh, against that, Okay. No, no. I'm, 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 I'm saying this because even, even yesterday, is it off? It's off. Yeah. Uh, we said, Tutuka is the area that you must look into. Uh, you see, if you want to have the positives, keep that kind of growth uh, getting up. And if you would want to see the negatives. We need to plow uh, some form of energy in a number of things. Personnel, uh, their commitment, and looking into matters of security, and uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, look out of the things uh, out there. So that's, that, that has been the observation, which I think uh, what Honorable Hadeva said yesterday, we must put our eyes on that uh, area, but not that area alone, in each and every area which produces uh, energy because there might be movement from there to other areas, from that other area to other areas uh, going out. So the board uh, must be committed to see that kind of uh, change uh, celebrated one way or the other. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Hon Honorable Samuel, through you, Chair. I um, appreciate your comments and uh, fully agree with you. Um, we certainly, part of what we um, see as important is that there is this continual measurement of interventions because you don't want to just tick a box and say we've put this intervention in place. You need to see whether the intervention is, is working sustainably over a period of time and making sure that whatever, as the Chair of ARC said earlier on in a different context, whatever we learn here, making sure that it is replicated across. Um, but everything that you've said, I can't agree with you more. Thank you. by 10 to 12.
it on the 22nd of um, we meet on the 22nd of Feb and you take the decisions that you have taken did that conversation or discussion reflect on the outstanding matters which would have been inclusive of this investigation to say, right, we are coming to the end of your employ, Mr. Director, but there's outstanding matters. So you're handing over company, property, and so on. What, what discussion was held around outstanding work, including but not limited to this investigation? Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of deep discussions around all the outstanding matters, as you can appreciate, the, the complexity um, at ESCOM there is quite a bit. Um, there wouldn't have been that length of a conversation around all the outstanding matters. So the investigation itself, uh, for example, um, was not discussed in the conversation that we had with uh, Mr. Derater at the time, um, but as the Chair of ARC has said, he was requested for um, to make sure that he, he hands over everything to, um, to, uh, to Eskom um, after um, we've had the meeting with him. Thank you, Chair. Where it falls short, however, is that <coughs> Mr. Drete had made allegations, and so before you take a decision, should you have not been, I would have asked one question to say, where do you base these allegations on? And then an investigation or a report, and then you take a decision. So wasn't there even what I can call a scratching off the surface question to say, how do you see, oh God, and make the kind of allegations that you do with substantive detail as opposed to the narrative that's there that these are things we already know. So I would imagine then that he had to base his response on something as a response to the board to say, I'm raising it up because of one, two, three. Thank you, Chair. Chair, the, the manner in which we, we handled it was to make, um, to, to resolve that we would have an independent investigation to make sure that we are covering all those aspects that was mentioned by Mr. Director and making sure that um, we have full understanding um, of all the issues. Um, the, the crux of the, the conversation in terms of why we felt that the, the trust was broken was not just about, it wasn't necessarily about the allegations around crime and, and, and corruption. And as you've um, heard earlier on in terms of the, the broader, um, broader is probably not the right word, but there were more components in there. So we would have wanted to look at everything, um, but to rather go the route of an independent investigation as opposed to the board going into an interrogation process um, with Mr. Derater, um, which would in, in itself would have, I, I suppose, if one had to deal with everything in the, um, in the interview, would have been a protect, protracted um, process. Um, the way you would deal with that is to have an investigation of independent minds to make sure that you, you, you turn every stone. Thank you, Chair. So you will have an investigation and you release your star witness who makes the allegations. Because I would imagine he's your point of reference on the allegations that have been made. Chair, we would not have assumed that we would have lost our star witness. Um, as Mr. Derater would have been CEO over the period of time that he'd been, um, he would still be obliged to, um, in relation to any investigation in regard to, to ESCOM, um, to be answerable in terms of any utterances that he would have made. Thank you. So, now, I'm not sure which question to prioritize now because I've got two issues. Now, but let me 
Mr. Nate. My sense is that <clears throat> the trust deficit, which uh, came to a head because of the interview, was an accumulation of events. So would I be correct in an assessment to say the interview was the last straw of a board which had a trust deficit with its CEO on one extreme, and the worst extreme be that there was just no more confidence that you had in the CEO. And then the interview sort of created the necessary perfect storm or conducive environment to effect a decision of quickening his exit, notwithstanding that the resignation was pending. Gee, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Um, I was shocked. I did not expect that Mr. Director would do what he did in terms of um, bypassing the board. Um, at that point in time, I certainly did not have an impression that there is a significant trust deficit um, between the board and the, um, the then GCO. Um, I hadn't been in any discussions and I'll ask the Chair of ARC to add if she's got anything to add where we would have had conversations around we don't trust him. Um, the, the fact that when he resigned, that we had asked him to stay longer than what he had intended to, that in itself for me is a message that says there's no way that we would have asked him to stay longer if there was a, there was a significant trust deficit. I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, no, no, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> absolutely to uh, collaborate with the, the doc here. That um, the fact that we extended his notice period by a month um, will be indication that it was not a strained relationship. And even from the date in which we received his resignation, which was somewhere around December, he operated in full tandem as the GCEO. The board did not step in or, you know, interfere in any way. We still respected that he was the CEO of the organization. So it came as an absolute surprise to me when I saw those media clips as well. Thank you. Right. Now, we are in receipt here of correspondence. Because I'm trying to go to the investigation. So, Mr. Terita is not lost on you as a board, right? So you were comfortable to that. Fine, even if he does go, you would still have a responsibility or be available to you. <clears throat> to what extent have you engaged him since then? And what has he brought to the table to assist you navigate these waters? Because you, you, you released him with an assurance, I suppose from yourselves and from a legal perspective on one end, that he would be available and accessible to yourselves. Yet you still don't have the report that he commissioned. Um, so, where are you then now? <coughs> Gee, where we are now is um, we still don't have the full picture, um, which we hope will be filled completely once we have the report. Um, and at that point, if there it is necessary, um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier on, that they, we had um, gone the route of the independent investigation as well, um, that there would be a reach out to Mr. Dorator. Uh, unfortunately, because we hadn't conferred with the, with the chair of the board on this in terms of um, communication, so I'm hesitant um, to, to say um, what exact communication they would have been after. Um, and in hindsight, in hindsight, I probably should have asked him the question before coming to you here today, um, but I also didn't expect that I would be the one talking. No, 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 that's fair enough. 
I'm sure the board will meet and discuss these matters further. My, my issue is, <clears throat> by your own admission, which is factual and not an indictment on yourselves, you are a new board, right? So you are in a position where you need to get a full scope and understanding of what's going on in the institution. And then your CEO, rightly or wrongly, has an interview and he makes explosive allegations. Is it, isn't that an opportunity to engage him as opposed to letting him go? As a new board, to rightly or wrongly view the allegations as an enabler of broadening your scope of understanding this new space uh, that you are in. And then in the discussion that you have, the alpha and omega of it is that right we accept that we are reverting back to a, a, a February um, leaving on your part and um, thank you very much we will contact you at a later stage with an independent investigation don't you consider it to be a missed opportunity to have engaged in the material uh, facts of the allegations as opposed to starting something anew, why wasn't he affecting in assisting you since he was in office uh, to craft the outlook of what the investigation would look like in terms of shape, form, and content and context? Thank you, Chair. I think when, when one goes back to the period in time where we are, because um, once again, you, you, you're talking about the rational mind of the board in the moment. Um, a board makes decisions on information that it has in front of them, uh, in front of it. If we had information, if we knew that there was an investigation of the nature of what we later understood the, um, the nature of the investigation was, if we knew that there was an intelligence uh, report, um, the, the tact that we may have taken then um, may or may not have been different, but be, um, as I said, you, a board applies its mind based on what is in front of it. I think what we're trying to do now is we're looking through a lens of knowledge of what has since transpired. And if you, if you cast your mind back, um, to that moment and time, and you apply the, the rules of what we know now, then it, it, makes, it, a very, it makes it difficult to, to look at it with absolute clarity. So going back to that moment in time, what we were sitting with is information that had come through in an, uh, an interview much of the, um, the, the allegations around uh, the, um, the corruption, uh, the criminality, um, information had already been brought to us through, and specifically through ARC. Um, it did not sound necessarily um, that everything was, that it was complete new revelations. Um, but there was information in there that, or speculation in there that had us very, very concerned. So you're sitting with a scenario where a CEO has not just bypassed the board and, and significant bridge trust significantly, but you're also sitting with a, a, um, a CEO who's speculating in, in the public space and tying that back to ESCOM, which makes it very difficult for the board. We would have had to, to deal with all of that. So if you have a choice, and you've got to choose between going this route and, or going that route, either way, there are consequences. Um, so which of the two do you go with? And a saying that I like to use is choosing the lesser of evils. Do you go the route of um, going through having to deal with now that a trust is broken and we're dealing with the relationship and you've got a few weeks left, literally a few weeks left, because the CEO has already resigned. Or on the other hand, you, you, you 
stop, you part ways here, and you go through a process of um, an investigation and, and deal with the matters um, as they factually come to you. Um, in that moment, that is the decision that we made. I don't think it is helpful to look at that decision through the lens of what we later understood was actually the fuller picture. What I'm trying to understand is, <clears throat> maybe let me qualify this. I'm, I'm certainly not doing Mr. Terita's bidding <laughs> for all intents and purposes. Even if you read his book, I don't think he likes me very much. I'm not the least bit bothered. <clears throat> Practically don't care. But he's in a position of authority. He's a CEO, and he makes allegations. He's got precar obligations. Doesn't the board test that to say the issues you are raising, have you raised them with the law enforcement agencies as per the dictates of the law in order for the board to make an informed decision? I, I, I don't get a sense that the allegations received the attention. What received the attention was his conduct which any board is entitled, correctly so, to sanction, uh, beat out a sanction on the conduct of an executive who, in your view, is conducted himself or herself outside the contractual obligations you have. You are within those rights. But then there's the substantive content of allegations. Why this becomes important, now, and this is where I'm going to, and what has been given to us, <clears throat> because then, the head of legal, in an email on the 30th of March, 2023, much of what um, is here is what uh, she said yesterday. But here are the recommendations she, she makes. From a good faith perspective, what we need to do now is act swiftly in order to protect ESCOM's interests against these alleged losses. Accordingly, the proposed scope is as follows. I'm imagining now this is the ENS investigation. One, a determination of the loss suffered by ESCOM arising from matters referred to in the interview. Two, a determination of persons responsible for such loss. And three, a recommendation as to the action to be taken by ESCOM against any such persons responsible for the loss. Fair enough. Then the recommendation goes on to say, we recommend that the scope not include, one, the persons to whom Andre referred to in his interview and the contents of what he told them. Two, issues relating to the transition from fossil fuel and issues relating to the just energy transition. Three, issues relating to the release of water. Four, issues relating to state security and five issues relating to the turnaround of ESCOM. The issues not to be included, I find to be the issues which must be included. And this arises out of a meeting which she says was between Caleb Mlauli and Fatima. <clears throat> so I'm trying to then to say now, so you've had this on the 22nd of March, you take the decisions, and then in end of March, the scope comes out for the ENS investigation. It's a limited scope, and the issues which it limits are the ones which are material and substantive in terms of connecting the dots, including but not limited to political interference, which is problematic. So what I'm trying to get at is the inability to engage Mr. Terita on the issues that he raised, rightly or wrongly in the public space, was a missed opportunity by the board. Because the after effect is that you have a head of legal who does not agree with your decision, advising you in a very limited scope. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, on, on the, um, the email dated, I think you say the 30th of March, um, I can say that from a, a board perspective, um, that had not 
as far as my memory goes, been discussed at that level yet, and um, I don't know whether um, the Chair of ARC would like to add to that. Yeah. Okay. If, um, if the Head of Legal is referring to a meeting, there was one meeting that had taken place um, between Caleb, myself, and uh, the Chair of the Board, Mr. Makwana, as well as the company secretary, and that was on the 15th of uh, March. Um, in terms of the scope of work as it went to ENS, we have not been, I have not been in view of it. So it wasn't a discussion in which we said we were going to chase this uh, as a scope and, and exclude, specifically exclude certain items as a scope. As I had mentioned yesterday, it was the view of the head of legal that we shouldn't be chasing claims um, or allegations when we could be investing our time and energy and uh, resources into uh, turning around the organization. Um, so unless uh, the GCEO had seen a specific uh, engagement letter, I did not. Uh, no, no, Chair, I haven't seen an engagement letter, but just that email that, that you're referring to. <clears throat> so this matter arises in February. We are now in June. There's still no, nothing that's come to you. Chair, there is no report yet from ENS. We haven't received any report on, on that scope. So have they been given a scope? That's what I'm gazing. Uh Chair, through legal, the scope would have been given to them. So through legal, and you would not have seen it? No, Chair. Right. So then I'm inclined to believe that the scope would have been this. So you see the problem. That's exactly the dilemma. <clears throat> I, you know what? I believe you me, had I been on the board and the CEO did what Mr. Director did, I would have just, I would have been annoyed and shocked as you were, right? But, but you look beyond that and the substantive issues are the ones which you look at. Because you say he remained in the employ of ESCOM, but you collected everything the next day and then he was at home. So what other access or interaction and engagement would have arisen then in the six days that he remained with you. I, d I don't get a sense that uh, these allegations re are receiving the attention of ESCOM to the extent to which they should, given their gravity. Because what is not in dispute is, according to testimony and the submissions before us, is that there's confirmation of political players involved in ESCOM. Nobody's denied it. The only resistance is to give us the names. <clears throat> so you probably settle here with the situation and that is ongoing because those people hide behind the veil of not being disclosed. They are still there in your space. I, I think hindsight being the best side and all the elements combined, this could have been handled far more differently. But it was a real-time decision that you took. And from your vantage point, yes, it can't be faulted. But I think the reflection that's required is the urgent practical action steps to mitigate against those allegations gaining traction and allowing them to go on gives a window of opportunity to press the reset button of those involved in ESCOM corruption to pursue a different modus operandi. Because from February to now, <clears throat> I don't get a sense that, you know, there's progress. So <laughs> your head of legal is leaving end of June. I would imagine that the one who are interacting with ENS, surely then there should be a heightened interest in the this period to interact with ENS before she leaves um, to, 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 to understand what it is that ENS is doing. I, I, I can't envisage a situation of such grave allegations and the board is not aware of the scope of what ENS is investigating. When Mr. Dorita was released, the board outlook was we will 
commission an independent investigation and then the board doesn't know, it's these kind of incoherences are that conveyor belt leakages and so far as accountability at this point is concerned. Chair, I, I can't <coughs> agree with you, you more in terms of um, the matter of urgency and I can assure you that um, at board level, there has been concerns expressed in terms of um, the urgency and, you know, and sometimes you wish you can jump in and do some stuff yourself, but we have dependencies um, and um, the pace at which um, some things are moving, we are not happy um, from that perspective. I fully agree with you in terms of your concern around the, the scope. Um, it is, it is, it's a little disconcerting um, to sit in a meeting like this and to hear that um, what we understood the scope to be and what has been um, conveyed may not necessarily align. Um, what we will definitely take back um, from this meeting is with urgency and we've got an ARC meeting coming up soon as well um, and we'll take it there as well to make sure that there is alignment. I can also give you assurance um, that I, know I was in the presence on a meeting when the chair of ARC has stressed that we need to make sure that they hand over process from the head of legal and especially um, those critical issues that would be sitting on her desk, um, that we don't have anything that falls um, through the cracks, cracks. So that is certainly and something that is important to us um, to make sure that we close all those loops. I don't know if you want to add anything, um, Fatima. Right. <coughs> I just want to, uh, apologies. Um, the issue has been raised around the wage negotiations and I think it will be helpful if we appraise uh, further and in more detail about it so that we could be able to understand it better. I know that you gave a very high level um, <clears throat> report now and I'm not asking for it now to just fly it so that police can be in a better position to understand it and its implications um, on, on, on ESCOM before we arrive at any uh, conclusions. My <clears throat> second to last point goes around the issues of security. We were at Jock and very interesting feeds that we saw. Mm -hmm. And then we juxtaposed those feeds to when we were at uh, Tutuwa. And then we begin asking ourselves the question, um, which, and it goes to what Honorable Fanenen said, the centralization and decentralization. <clears throat> there is a semblance of coherence here at head office. But when you go to the sides, it's not there. And I'm wanting to flag to Tuva as probably one where you need to pilot further what Jock is doing because they reported losses of 144 million rands in terms of spares in the last financial year. So <clears throat> those security capabilities that you are building up must, amongst others, um, fix those uh, uh, issues. Um, and I think there's 19 million rands that's projected now of losses as well. But, uh, Last reporting period is 144 million rands losses in space. Um, and then when we were there, there's material and space sitting outside, you know, with millions of rands without the necessary, you know, and proper storage facility for it. Soon those things will, you will have to write them off. So what, what I'm <clears throat> really wanting to stress is what I concluded on yesterday. Unless head offices felt at your sites, 
the boots on the ground leadership and management of head office on the sites will have a problem. The head of procurement has not been to any of them. She's relying on someone to send her information and go on her behalf. You need to get out of head office. Um, because desktop oversight and reporting is precisely what has driven us to this kind of oversight, where we leave Cape Town and we go to the respective areas. Because what's generally reported on paper is not actually what's on the ground. So there's a heightened sense of cherry picking and all sorts of other things. So if there's anything that we leave with today is in ESCOM head office, that is where it operates at the sites. You've got HR there, you've got procurement and security. The, in, those sites are institutions on their own. So it, there has to be a paradigm shift in terms of management and direction uh, in that regard. So I just wanted to raise those issues. Why we asked for HR to come is because there was a lot of uh, issues raised yesterday in so far as contractual obligations of employees is concerned, the issues of leaks, integrity of workers con handling information of ESCOM, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and the contestation uh, which prevails in certain quarters is, is the nuanced discussion to say, well, what is disrepute and what, what is not disrepute? But really the issue is HR and primarily why we asked you to come today is to and take us through the employee expectations that you have what, in terms of handling is common information and what measures are being put in place to provide clarity on the do's and don'ts. Because amongst others, we're going to end up debating the semantics and what what. <coughs> Head office must provide direction and leadership. So um, thank you very much uh, for coming through. And if there's any other issues that you'd like to share, uh, please uh, feel free. So over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. Um, in terms of the obligations of employees um, at ESCOM, um, there's no ambiguity. So on your day one of work at ESCOM, um, you get a whole pack of forms, and, and, and those are also related to the way we do things here. One of them is that no employee is allowed to use ESCOM's information for personal benefit or personal gain, and that's a clear misconduct. So every single employee at ESCOM who has got a unique number has signed that form and committed themselves uh, with a witness to then say, I will uh, comply with the regulations and the rules um, in the organization where we had found like sort of obvious, obvious bridges, they've always been followed uh, by a disciplinary process. So, so that's in terms of um, uh, the, um, the obligations that employees have uh, on, on the organization. We have in the past even where senior employees would go out on social media and uh, uh, um, put the organization in a difficult situation we have also addressed that, and, and there was one case which was a very popular case, uh, which um, the former CEO um, had personally been involved in terms of addressing a matter where a senior manager had gone on to an internal WhatsApp group and effectively um, uh, badmouthed the leadership of ESCOM. So we have always frowned upon uh, any employee who would uh, then use ESCOM's information, uh, even more so if you are senior, the obligation is even uh, bigger because you've got access to more information. 
Uh, secondary to that, all the senior managers at ESCOM, um, they go through a vetting and screening. Um, at our level at ESCO, we also have a top uh, secret clearance as, 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 as members, and that is a compulsory uh, matter uh, for all senior executives at ESCOM. Compulsory, but you see who left here not vetted. The head of legal will be leaving here not vetted. Compulsory to what extent, and to what extent do you tolerate? So, so there's, there's no tolerance. Um, uh, over the years, there had been an uh, interdependency. Um, our security function facilitates the process, but um, we also depending on, on, on the external structures um, to, to support. I am aware that some of our colleagues have been queuing, but I do know that that has received a priority uh, for me personally, I haven't had issues with vetting, so um, we, every time uh, the vetting expired, uh, we would be queued for the next one. So I'm not aware of any other delays besides the in interdependencies with the authorities that conduct the vettings. But yes, they are compulsory. All of us at EXCO are expected to be vetted, and for EXCO in particular, uh, top clearances Top secret clearance is also a minimum requirement. How long have you been in the head of HR? How long have I been in? The head of HR. Um, I have been the head of HR since 2016. Right. <coughs> so then you'd be aware that as of June 30, 2022, Mr. Director was not vetted. You were vetted. The then head of generation was not vetted. The GM then in the office of the GCE was still awaiting feedback. CFO slash now uh, acting CEO then was awaiting feedback. The then COO was awaiting approval. The chief nuclear officer was in progress. Procurement was acting in progress. Group capital acting then was in progress. And the list goes on. But what I can show you from this slide is that, you can just sort far, but the ones better than the ones in green of that long list, which is five of a very long list. So how can you then not be aware the challenges around that because you would then have to put in place mechanisms to assist the process. Uh, thank you so much. It's highly likely that I wouldn't be aware because I don't have 100% line of sight um, in terms of, of the vetting process. Uh, that's managed through the security department and the executive support uh, department, particularly for your uh, top executives at ESCOM. But I can confirm that it's a minimum requirement that uh, all of us have to be vetted. It's not a minimum requirement, it's a cabinet decision. You are an SOE decision of 2014. It can't be a minimum requirement, and you said it's compulsory. I, I know that it's a matter of semantics on my side. I do agree that it's compulsory. Yeah, so. I just, I would, you know, you're going to have line of sight on a, a key area of office. Yeah. Uh, right. I hope the board is noting this because really we're still going to get a briefing and update. Right. Finally, um, now you've, you've spoken um, at length about how to handle information that belongs to the company. With the content of the interview that the former GCE would be in the scope of information that should not have gone out, 
in terms of the obligations that an, an employee would have at his school. I'm trying to gauge the standard to the level at which people in the institution can and cannot speak and what they can say and cannot say. I'm all for transparency, but I also understand that institutions have got rules and regulations. So where would you place that interview? Um, I would place the interview in the same category, uh, given that every single employee at ESCOM um, has the same accountability in terms of information. Uh, we do have internal processes. Uh, I would have expected, for example, based on what we have to exhaust your internal processes before any employee goes external. And that's how we've treated all employees um, uh, in terms of going external before they've exhausted the internal processes. Colleagues, are there any? Thank you very much. Are there any questions? All right. Can we get the information on fidelity uh, and those three areas, right? Fidelity, rating, and the, the timeline was spoken to, right, in terms of sequencing of what the board said, right? Can we go to those issues that Honorable Hattie had started off with um, yesterday? Stand by, please. No, to to the head of HR. If if um, indeed vetting is compulsory, and a person in a position of um, uh, GCE um, has delayed in ensuring that he meets such uh, minimum requirements whose responsibility it is to make a follow-up uh, and ensure that um, the group chief executive is vetted, given his position. So, so if, if you look at uh, delegation of authority as well as a memorandum of incorporation, the appointment of the group chief executive and the chief financial officer is the responsibility of the board. Yeah, no, I'm asking a rhetorical question. Uh, it's a pity that the board, um, we dealing with the new board. Uh, I just wanted to paint a picture that um, our focus should be directed um, at the former board. Um, I don't know to what extent we can hold them accountable. Uh, in relation to pursuing, uh, declaring someone a delinquent direct. Um, I'm asking on those basis, given the gravity of having someone for three years uh, occupying such position without him being uh, given the necessary clearance um, and having alluded to the fact that uh, indeed it is a minimum requirement and given what has transpired as well, mm. what would you advise the board to do? One, having also acknowledged the fact that no individual can use um, the information of ESCOM to his or her personal gain. Um, but the tricky part is that such is, re is referring to an existing or member of ESCOM. In the case of the former group chief executive, he's no longer the employee of ESCOM. And I don't think anyone would doubt that him producing a book um, is using um, the information that he acquired when he was still a group chief executive of ESCOM to his personal advantage and personal gain. What would you advise the, the, the board to do in that regard? I, I, 
I think, uh, uh, Honorable Member, I think moving forward um, uh, from our perspective of HR, especially in the administration of the personnel files of the um, uh, executives, we need to be more proactive and, and follow through where we're seeing gaps um, of, 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 of uh, vetting. And I think given where we are now, it's a bit embarrassing to also um, having to acknowledge that for the longest time the former CEO had not been vetted. So I think for us it's a big lesson as an organization. Moving forward, uh, we will ensure that we proactively identify those. If there are blockages in terms of the structures that are assisting us with vetting, we also effect the relevant interventions. So um, that's a lesson for us taking forward. L lastly, so do, do you also share the view um, that says we may be going down an unnecessary rabbit hole which will serve very little value to ESCOP if you pursue um, Mr. Director as per the advice of, of um, male governor. Do you share the same views? Um, should we follow the proposal or you you hold a different view or opinion to what was given to the board. I'm just trying to also gather um, different perspective to assist us as, as parliament to arriving at the well-considered perspective and not rely on uh, one perspective in understanding issues. Uh, given my, my role and my responsibility, I'm all for fairness. Um, I believe that the way we would have treated a B band, uh, we should continue treating every everybody the same way. Um, when uh, uh, after the uh, the aftermath of, of, of state capture and so on, um, as executives and as employees, we've always said even if someone resigns uh, before. A, a disciplinary process is concluded, we should pursue other avenues. Um, we should be seen as an organization to be implementing consequence management fairly, uh, whether someone has stayed or whether they have left. Uh, my personal view, because you have moved me there, uh, given the, the, the role of the former chief executive, I think we would be seen as exemplary, as ESCOM, uh, if we see this through. That's my personal view. Thank you. I have no further questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to the fidelity 500 million and the vetting. Uh, Chair, uh, can we start with the vetting? James, has just walked in. Uh, this, as it uh, June now, 20th of June, uh, this is a summary I've received from, from security. Uh, currently, in terms of the executive members, there are, and we'll submit this to, to, to the scope uh, secretariat chair, uh, there are five executives that have top secret and secret clearance. Uh, these include myself, Caleb Kassam, uh, uh, top, top secret, Sikamotsu Skiapas, head of transmission, top secret, Alci Pule, our group is HR, top secret, and Karen Pule, uh, security top secret secret clearance andrew etzinger who is our general manager of africa strategy in terms of in in progress and uh, uh, submissions for 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 vetting there are four submissions in progress uh, that's uh, the company secretary uh, uh, our general manager, sustainability, uh, Kesri Patla, and our group executive of the transformation office, Vuyu Chuku. Uh, Mr. Bala is in progress uh, of engaging on the SAA, SSA. Uh, that's the fourth one, and then there are five outstanding submissions. Uh, the forms uh, have been issued. Uh, and need to be submitted uh, to SSA. So currently only five that have received clearance, Chair. You didn't read the five outstanding. 
Oh, oh f five outstanding is uh, uh, Generation, uh, Biki Namalo, uh, Changi Sanka, CPO, uh, uh, CIO, uh, Faith Burn, uh, General Manager Strategy and Planning, uh, Matthew Mfatewa, and then Mal Governor, Head of Legal. Those are the outstanding ones. Thank you. Uh, no, no, thanks, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, and, and thanks to uh, the acting uh, GCO. Um, where, where is the, the COO? Uh, COO. She, the COO is, uh, well, not COO, ex COO, I, I guess. Oh, yeah. Because uh -huh. uh, he's no more the COO. Uh, He's uh, overseas uh, in terms of uh, uh, a travel uh, business trip uh, to engage with one of the suppliers. He's always overseas, eh? He's, he's, he's always overseas. Let me start there. He's always overseas. Uh, yeah. Uh, Honorable Somio, is, he does, he's not always overseas, but uh, yeah, he does, he did have a lot of trips. On this one, there was a specific one to a specific supplier. Uh -huh. Okay. What is his role now? Uh, Chi is, is, is on a fixed term contract uh, where he's focusing on uh, the Kusili uh, temporary tax recoveries, uh, as well as on the permanent stack recoveries. And then also focusing on the Kuberg uh, stations in terms of the steam generator and then more importantly uh, to ensure that we do the LTOs for, for the Kuberg life extension. Specifically, that's the key focus areas uh, where Yanni is supporting myself uh, as the CEO or, and or future CEO. Uh, that is critical, uh, as you would appreciate, from a generation perspective going forward. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's very critical. I, I agree with you. In relationship uh, uh, with uh, the newly appointed um, uh, general executive operations, so I want to capture his role. Uh, what, what is his role? Uh, in the in the in the company, where does where does he stand? So so he doesn't sit on he doesn't he's not involved in operations. He doesn't sit in any committees or or etc. Uh, it's he, he reports directly to myself as the CEO uh, on those two special projects to focus on that. So he's not in operations at all or any of the committees. But you're not an engineer. No, I'm not, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, I think the criticality of those two projects is important in the interest of the organization. Is that not impacting on the generation? Why is it directly reporting to yourself rather than to the uh, GCG um, head of a generation, if, if that is the case? No, uh, I think that the head of generation must, must continue to focus on, on the operations which Becky Namalo is doing. I think just to get, uh, uh, to ensure that these projects happen, uh, that from my perspective uh, in analyzing uh, the challenges that are facing Eskom, I thought it was important to, to have that view uh, on, on that status update on a regular basis and an oversight on, on the Kusila as well as the Kuberg uh, projects. Now we have heard that, uh, in fact, you have been reading the list of people who have been uh, vetted. Yes. Uh, does he appear in that list because he, if he left, he left with the cloud? Uh, n no, on this list, uh, I don't think he's been vetted. He didn't complete his vetting. That's my understanding. And they are still keeping him? Uh, that was uh, a decision as uh, the acting CEO where I applied my mind. I thought it's important that uh, we do retain that uh, resources and, and that skill for ESCOM. So you don't believe in the 
uh, the appointed um, the head of generation? No, no. Chair, uh, I have full confidence in Becky Numalo. Uh, I'll give him my full support. He knows that, and I've expressed this on many occasions. So he has my full support. I think it's also let him focus on getting the EAF up at, at, at the stations uh, while these other projects continue as well. Well, Chair, it's my view. Uh, that uh, that's a matter which need to be flagged probably true to the board um, on the remnants. Um, you see, what we have experienced um, uh, in his uh, previous position, there was a lot of uh, interference on stability, uh, specifically uh, on the areas that you have cited. The operational capability uh, at Kusile, where each and every time we visit there, you would find new uh, persons who are responsible uh, for uh, various uh, project management uh, capabilities. And uh, that's what you have said this morning, uh, that uh, such instability would have had some kind of negative uh, impact around, around such. I've personally cited that fact every time that we came here, uh, which we told that is on a trip overseas on a trip overseas, on a trip overseas. And since then, there's been no improvement at the time uh, in terms of what we want to see in as far as generation is concerned. So, so it's very much concerning. That's why I'm raising uh, that point. And, and uh, therefore, the actual upkeep uh, in as far as the capability uh, of ESCOM's um, generation ability uh, need to be assessed on the basis of some contributions by individuals in one way or the other, because it tracks your ability uh, in terms not only generation, your own standing in as far as the revenue uh, capacity is concerned, because the more you generate, the more anticipated in terms of earnings and the gains uh, in as far as ESCOM uh, performance is concerned. And if you agree uh, uh, with me on that point, uh, it might be that uh, um, uh, there, there is a need uh, uh, of a, a sense of looking. I can't decide for you, uh, but uh, looking into uh, these uh, possibilities, which are, uh, I view them, uh, might impact on a negative side. Uh, there is some level uh, of uh, uh, attention which ought to be kept uh, uh, out, uh, out, out there. Uh, you know, thank you very much, Honorable uh, Chairperson. Okay. Uh, 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 acting GCE, you said to what, what, what is the new role now from the former COO? So, so his main focus is on the Kusile stack recoveries, the temporary stacks as well as the permanent stacks, and then on the Kuberg steam generator together with the uh, with, with, with ensuring that we do get the life extension on Kuburg. Yes, but what is his title now? So from that, uh, I, would, uh, I, I regard him as re ensuring that he's uh, reviewing those projects as like a project director of those two key projects for us, for myself, as the GCE. So this is not an existing um, position. You've just created a position for him. Yes, he reports directly to myself. So you've created the post uh, for him? Well, he's just a fixed-term contractor. Yes. Because the reason why we wanted him also to appear before us is to understand his role um, as a COO in terms of all these things and all these allegations. Um, what has he done? Yes. Um, and we have not had an opportunity to engage him. And there he is being given a, a new role, um, having had an opportunity to fully comply with issues of vetting, and he opted not to, because he did not finish um, the relevant authorities with certain information 
that was outstanding for a very long time. And you still regard that person as very critical, uh, valuable, adding value to, to the uh, company. Yet his actions uh, suggest otherwise. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand um, your, your prerogative in, 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 in this regard and with all these issues uh, uh, that was happening and all these re revelations, Chief Operations Officer, where was he in terms of the allegation as alleged by the former Group Chief Executive and what was he, have you taken time to find out from him um, how and when did he contribute in ensuring that these issues as reflected in the interview and subsequently the book were addressed? Have you taken time before uh, giving him this responsibility to go uh, overseas to deal with this uh, very key and, and, and influential uh, suppliers? And knowing fully well that uh, there are question marks surrounding ESCOM suppliers. Thank you. Uh, uh, Honorable Adibia, I obviously in terms of uh, my, my question to him around uh, after the, the interview and this allegations reports, I've asked Jan, Jan, uh, did, did you receive or have a copy of the Fivers report? He responded to me that he does not. Uh, have a copy of it. Uh, he has not seen it uh, in terms of the FIVUS report and allegations. That was the response I received from Jan with regard to, to that allegations uh, yeah, in terms of the FIVUS report. Uh, in terms of the, the book, uh, no, I, uh, I haven't specifically asked him about all the details in Andre's book, I've not done that, uh, Honorable Khadibi. Uh, yes. my, my question is, as a chief operations officer, yes. given these allegations, the extent and the nature, and they points to operations within ESCOM, have you asked him what was his role in mitigating all this before you um, create a new post for him? Have you taken time to say, look, um, I've got an intention of uh, keeping you, for you to assist us, but please take me to confidence that, uh, please demonstrate um, w what you have done in your position in relation to this allegation. Uh, no, I To haven't. justify your appointment, to say, look, yeah. I've applied my mind. Yes. Now I've sat down with this gentleman. This is what he has contributed um, in relation to this allegation. And based on what um, his efforts uh, in achieving whatever stability and dealing with this matter, I think we can still use him. Uh, wh what was your barometer or basis of continuing with him amid these allegations? So yeah. if you were to explain and, and try to convince me to say you've made a correct decision, yeah. what would you base your decision upon? in relation to the allegation. So, so I, I did not have a discussion with regard, with regard to Jan, with regard to all the allegations. Uh, as I said, I asked about the Fivers report. The reason why I, I decided that I need his support uh, because of the importance of the Kusili station and getting that online uh, by November uh, and December this year is critical for Eskom as well as uh, the, the, the Kuburg outages that we are busy with. So that was my, my main focus uh, for offering him a contract in terms of the capacity that we need to get online. In terms of those specific allegations, no, I have not had that discussion in his role as previous CEO. Would you agree with me that he had an opportunity to do that? Um, while he was still 
uh, COO before he resigns? Yeah, I think definitely, and uh, uh, that, that, and you can raise that with him as well. I think he definitely had an opportunity to do that. But you felt that uh, he must be employed on a contract basis in order for him to do what he had time and opportunity to do while he was still a COO. So, so again, I, I think you so know what, what he could not do while he was a, a, a chief operations officer, yeah. he would be able to do on a contract basis uh, uh, no. outside his role and responsibility. No. So, so, uh, so the reason for my decision is, if you look at where Eskom is uh, at the end of April when his contract ended as, as the permanent employee, where we were with load shedding and what the outlook was in terms of going forward. The importance of getting a successful Kusile three units back. I had to weigh up the business decision of having someone uh, with Jan's experience uh, to, 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 to help oversee that critical project of Kusile as well as the Kuberg outage. Uh, when I look at that and I compare it to uh, what is uh, at stake for Eskom and the country, uh, it made sense in my mind as acting CEO to mitigate that risk uh, going forward. So I, I, I didn't use so much of the past. I was focusing on the current and the future and how do we mitigate that as Eskom. Just clarity, did he resign or his contract? No, he, uh, he came to the end. He reached the age of 65 as a oh. permanent employee. Okay. How long is this contract of him of project director? I think that's the title you used. Yes, I have a uh, contract with Jan for two years because uh, you need to complete the temporary stacks this year. By end of December is the permanent stacks for Kusile, and then you're doing the steam generators plus the uh, life extension of Kuberg, which will run into next year, Chair. How it much covers is, that. Sorry, yes? It covers that period. How much is this contract costing us? Uh, Chair, it's based on the previous salary that, that he had at that point in time. One small thing for me is that do you recall that uh, the SEO has been there all the time when we experience the same problems uh, you want him to intervene on? He had all the opportunities so, uh, to play it positive uh, in terms of assisting uh, the actual uh, maintenance of the plant through his own role as a COO? Uh, Honorable uh, Somio, Yes, uh, that is the role of uh, uh, a COO in terms of the performance of the operations. Uh, and yes, uh, I think you can ask him the details when, when, you, when you do meet him uh, on, on his performance. Uh, but uh, I think uh, also, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, if you look purely on, on an EAF perspective, anyone can see the trend that the EAF did deteriorate. Uh, I think one has to question if you did not have interventions, would it have been worse? He can answer that. I'm not that technical person. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. My question gets there. He reports to you. You're not that technical person. And uh, he has been there. There's been those sustained failures over time. And, and uh, what, what the, I'm shifting my question now to the board. Um, as a board, here is the situation which needs your attention. How, how would you um, uh, respond uh, in the nature of things um, that, that, that you see someone who was supposed to be vetted left the institution without being vetted the same person has been contracted in the similar uh, activities 
though untitled, uh, to deal with the same environment where there's been sustained failures and, and uh, what, what is your take around such and a take home uh, remuneration which uh, is uh, standing at the height uh, of uh, expectation uh, in as far as the required performance is concerned. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Samuel. Um, the, the concerns that you have raised are obviously for us concerns as well. I can say to you that um, the board, um, specifically in the Human Capital and Remuneration Committee, um, we've had a discussion with the, the acting GCO um, at the time when we became aware of the uh, appointment um, because of where the position sits, similarly like what you said, I can't tell you what to do. We raised our concerns with them and said you need to go and check these areas. Um, subsequently to, to that meeting, um, we then started also asking about who does he report to. Um, it's a very fine balancing act because as, as the board, you, you have to make sure that there is accountability, but at the same time, not step into the operational domain and give instructions in the operational domain. So where this position sits is in the operational domain, but because of the nature of the questions around the position, of course, we, we, we have taken an interest. Um, unfortunately for us, you came um, just before we were going to have our next meeting because in our last um, Human Capital Remuneration Committee we ran out of time and um, we, we then scheduled another meeting which I believe is next week Friday and one of the items that we wanted the, um, G the GCO to come back to us on is the questions around these reporting lines because we weren't clear in our own heads around that. And if I may come in, uh, Honorable Samuel is that it is an outstanding a matter arising from the last ARC meeting as well. And ARC is meeting on Monday on, from a different perspective, but on the appointment of, um, yeah, on a fixed-term contract. Thank you. All right, it's receiving uh, attention. You see, GCE, where it becomes problematic, I agree with the board in that operational matters are your matters, it's not the board's, it's not ours. But we can't help but not assess. We are coming from an era of heightened usage of I am doing this, including a mega investigation which cost 50 million rand, right? My sense is that we must, whilst we are responsible in our own spaces, must not allow a situation where we build systems around individuals. My own outlook would be the former COO, there should have been skills transfer and skills development for the work that he was doing in order for the work to continue post his retirement. So you would not have to create this. That's point number one. Point number two, my assessment is the board says, listening to the chair on Monday, they are dispensing with this position of COO in any case, right? So they, it's been taken out of the organogram, amongst others, maybe because it didn't add value, right, to the institution. And the point of reference would have been the incumbent insofar as that position is concerned. Now they come back as a project director. And it's like throwing yourself a javelin. You throw it here and catch it yourself there. Same salary scale and so on and so forth. Yet substantively, the issues which are at play specifically around Gusile, happened on the watch of the individual you're bringing back. So it just, it raises flags. Skills transfer should have happened. 
in anticipation of the retirement because it's an inevitable eventuality. It will arise. So why are there no internal skills, capabilities, knowledge, expertise in ESCO to do this? So I'll give you a final example. It's in the political space, I always tell members when I'm inaugurating a branch, don't be a member's member. Because if I drop dead now and die, your political allegiance goes into the ground with you, with me, because you are my member and not the party's member. In avoidance of the situation of individuals becoming the system. It's precisely why seemingly nobody at ESCOM knows about the investigation or has the report, because it became the preserve of one individual insofar as its construct. Seated there, none of you can tell us what information came in or came out of ESCOM and was utilized for the purposes of that investigation because the project became the preserve of an individual. Now, are we to conclude that Medu Kusile, as a project, became the preserve of an individual and therefore when the retirement <coughs> age came, we, created, we, we were so dependent on them that there was no other options? Those are risks to governance and their risk to the institution. So I was just amplifying that. Let's get the report on the fidelity to 500 million years. I just want the board to assist us to check whether or not there are no duplication in what the group executive of generation, Mr. Momalo, is doing with what um, uh, the former COO is doing. And what then will happen when the new GCE comes in? Will he be stuck with this person um, until his contract ends? Um, and th that will assist us to, to ascertain uh, the logic behind. Because I see this, if you've got a group executive responsible for generation, um, this function ought to belong to that particular individual. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, Honorable Hadebe, I will definitely take, because there are two components. There's the employment side, so the, um, from a human capital and remuneration committee perspective, but the, the key that you're asking in terms of that duplication, that I will take to the, the Chair of BOPC, that engineering group, um, so that they also look at it. Thank you very much for, for that. Including but not limited to reporting function as to whether should then, since they are here, should they then, the reporting not go to, I mean, or even if it's dual reporting, but look at the whole thing, satisfy Definitely yourselves. Definitely on our agenda, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, we'll leave that to you. Fidelity, 500 million. Chair, the CPO is here. Very welcome. Uh, thank Mr. you. Day and Please dive right into it. It's the Thank same you, Chair. Faces. Same faces. Thank you, members. Again, my voice is a little bit toss. Um, I will try to speak as loud as I can. So, Chair, thank you very much, and members, for indulging me to bring my file through the next morning. I didn't want to confuse myself with the dates and, and times. But perhaps first I can just confirm, uh, and the GCE can indicate the same, that there is an investigation with forensics that has not been completed. Um, and without prejudicing the outcome of that, that investigation, I'm going to be sharing all of the information that I have from a procurement perspective um, at my disposal. And obviously then I may not be able to answer some of the questions that forensics is dealing with, but I certainly can deal with the issues that I have, the information in front of me, if that's in order. I don't know, Caleb, if you want to add. All right, so getting straight into it, so in terms of the emergency and the documents at my disposal and, and the names, et cetera, which we like, I thought I'd quickly run through a timeline this morning which would mean, mean that we just simplify the storyline as to what we have at our disposal in terms of the procurement process and, and, and those involved in the early stages. So what we have is the start of an emergency declaration on the 4th of July. That emergency declaration and the completion of those necessary uh, uh, forms, et cetera, was, 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 uh, by, was created by our, our GM security. 
and, and signed off by the COO. The basis of that emergency was amongst other things, and I'm going to just squeeze through the scope because you indicated I should, uh, I should mention that specifically. And it says provision of specialized armed security guards and technology deployed for intelligence-led protection of identified escorts. Sorry. Proceed, ma'am. All right, maybe if I could just start the sentence again. So it's the pro in terms of the description of the scope of works, which is just a summary, it is the provision of specialized armed security guards and technology deployment for intelligence-led protection of identified ESCOM assets and infrastructure located on crime hotspots areas nationally and across ESCOM's divisions. So that was the basis, and that basically was signed on the 4th of July. The next day, uh, that is the 5th of July, I can see that we have received a quotation from um, Fidelity in terms of a proposed uh, rates and works for this period of this uh, emergency. I can also confirm maybe on the first one that it is an estimated cost of 500 million and um, it does indicate exactly uh, how long it would be. So then the following morning there is a budget um, and a quotation from, from um, the supplier in terms of a range of services and a strategy on how to deal with this, um, with this threat. And that particular request, now that's the 5th of July, uh, was reviewed by the GM security and um, there was then a uh, quantity surveyor who gave a QS report against the cost on the 7th of July um, indicating um, as a summary of the cost report that this figures and the quotation is below market price. So that's the QS report on the 7th of July. On the 12th of July it went to generation board and the generation board approved transaction and this emergency and their portion was uh, remember the 500 million was split amongst the different stations so generation approved on the 12th of July 225 million then for this uh, emergency at the same time um, the young signature on the emergency declaration only is on the 19th of, uh, of July so the document has been processed before that but that is not necessarily unusual because there may be other communication via WhatsApp or, or emails, et cetera, authorizing these, uh, these, these transactions before the time, but on the form itself, it's dated 19th of July. On the, um, on the actual um, uh, emergency itself, uh, there is a budget approval. The budget approval has been signed off by a GM in finance, and it is for, for the same uh, scope as indicated for a um, for provision for 500 million for this emergency. It is not necessary to get a budget up front for an emergency because essentially if you have an emergency condition you may proceed. But before the first payment was actually made, uh, a budget provision was made. There's uh, invoices from the 5th of, 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 of August that are certified uh, and assessed by our GM in, uh, in uh, security and those invoices that are mounting the invoices were then paid over Seventh of November, transmission waited for the end of the emergency period, and actually uh, approved their portion of the budget, which I think was 67 million. I can check with you again for their portion of the of the emergency. The emergency then went through a sample. There was a ANF audit that took place on the 6th of March, in which case the um, this particular transaction was sampled, and the audit rating is one which means there were no findings in terms of the processes that were followed in, in, in determining this emergency. So that report is, for, is signed off by ANF on the um, 6th of March. At the same time, there were many queries that came through. I think Kaposa is one of them, requesting for an investigation in, into this transaction. I do not have the draft of the final report of that investigation. in terms of the, the threat identification and the threat assessment part. Um, that one paragraph 
that we have just read, does it constitute threat identification or threat assessment based on your understanding of requirements of uh, emergency contracts? So, um, Chair, the, that is all that is in the documents itself. There is no attached report in terms of a threat assessment. Um, subsequent to the time in terms of the current investigations, we have asked if there are any um, formal documents or formal communication, and I've not received any. So, that approval was done without the necessary documentation as it relates to threat identification and threat assessment. There are no further documents at your disposal. So, Chair, at that time of the transaction, because we keep the documents, obviously that's what I'm saying is date stamped. So as at 4th of July, there was no attachment or report that is in the procurement file to substantiate the Sunday document. I have no further question, Chair. Hello, Samuel. Well, thank, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, thanks to the, the head of procurement. But just a problem, two or three areas. One, one in, in, in terms of your the paragraph, which which is uh, informs the decision. It talks about the technical heavy. Uh, security, that is some kind of technical um, uh, expertise, uh, and, and such expertise which are technical are of the indication uh, uh, of what is needed to be an outcome. The second area is, is, is saying intelligence-driven um, capacity, capability, um, uh, which is a, as well a, a requirement for assessment. And the third uh, angle, as I have uh, trying to listen and hear, uh, the criminal uh, uh, aspect in terms of capacity capability, which would be able to deal with uh, matters of criminality um, uh, in a substantive way. So your assessment was going to be based uh, at this. Uh, there might be others uh, that you have uh, somewhat highlighted. But though you say uh, only fidelity uh, proposal was received, was that intentional, or was that from a a pool of things uh, out there, or has there been no any other one would have found shown interest in as far as these uh, capabilities are concerned? Um, so, after the time, or after the effect, which means recently, I've asked for clarity to unpack the scope. So this is now after the effect and after the emergency. So maybe um, I can, if that, that's okay with you, just read out some of the bullets on, on what was the actual scope of work, because the initial one was, was obviously a paragraph. All right, so some of the things it says, which will be the basis of actually uh, working out the payments, is access control and searching of vehicle crime prevention and observations, crowd observations, um, deployment in a swift, agile, and observant way, foot patrols, vehicles, people, equipment, search and entry, um, reaction to any security emergencies, proactive assessment of information from various sources, prevention of unauthorized removal of assets, detecting contraband on people, escorting of fuel and coal trucks to the way beach, providing situational and operational reporting, recording of even events and inc incidents, performing crime scene management, drone pat patrol by licensed drone op operators, helicopter support, and any um, aviation or breaches. So, so that was just further to that in the quote itself, if you want to do that. So uh, with respect to receiving other quotes, no, it is confirmed that only one quote was received. No, no. It was. Okay. You, you published it or you somewhat uh, had your own pool? 
so the contract, according to the paper trail, is directly to that one supplier, so there wasn't any publishing. So, so a supplier was contacted? That is correct. By whom? By um, the GM security. So no, no, no other? Is that the practice? Uh, in emergency situations, the end user can actually contact a single supplier. Just one second. To please respond to that first part of the question, because you shook your head now. That doesn't run in the... So, no other suppliers were contacted. We did not publish the, the tender or the, the, the request, and, and the, the request for the quotation only went to one supplier via the GM security. And, and um, with, 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 with the uh, wage, uh, you see capability of the supplier, uh, the supplier contained all the required as, as specifications um, in terms of uh, uh, expectation? Um, yes, so uh, a scope of work would have been issued to the supplier um, and the supplier would respond into those categories. And, and I have, as I said, it's, it's those, those specific things that were requested for and those are the items that were costed for in the security. Head of security is the originator. Of the emergency, uh, well, it's the person that filled the documents, but obviously the the person that signed off the emergency is the CEO. Who's the originator? So, so the originator uh, of of this uh, whole thing is 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 the head of security. The compiler of the document. Chair, yeah, I just want to make sure the compiler of the document, obviously in conjunction with. Um, the COO, they would, they would have packaged the documents, but the document is approved by the COO. Let's get to that. Uh, this, the, the GM security would have received some alert that there's a security problem, and then they would have activated the, So they may not be the originator, but they're the compiler. Is that how it works? Yes, sure, the compiler. I just want to make sure. You know, there's confusion, which is, she, she, she as well applies that kind of confusion, because the documentation was coming from the head of security and and, 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 and the CEO. So it's one, one document with two signatures? With two signatures? Yes. And then thereafter, what, what's the role of the head of procurement? In the emergency, no role, Chair. Because at the start of an emergency, you're not actually using a normal procurement process. This is a procurement issue. And as a procurement issue, uh, it ought to reside with a procurement office. In this instance, it's only a file keeper. Uh, you see, not necessarily responsible for procuring such services. Uh, is that there's no normality there, uh, you see? And, and uh, does it not require some kind of indulgence uh, in as far as the GCE or the board is concerned? Uh, maybe as part of your own investigation, maybe I'm asking questions which are part of your own investigations, pardon me if that is the case, but I think it, it raises some kind uh, of a, a, a loophole that was emergency procurement uh, does not necessarily uh, suggest the uh, flouting uh, of some kind uh, of a di 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 division uh, of a platforms in terms of decisions uh, on such uh, requirements. I think um, there was a, a, a disclaimer when she started. The matter is being investigated by forensic. to that investigation, all we will request is the consideration of Treasury Note 3 and the, on the expansions and deviations vis-a-vis -vis Section 217 of the Constitution. In all that you will do, because we are not clear is how a mega project such as this one 
cost in emergency in the budget of 500 million would not be in the peer view of the CPO or the CFO. It's a GM security, COO, CEO. But the money people are not there. So who then bears the responsibilities National Treasury Note 3 when you are deviating from normal processes as part of because ESCOM is one of the biggest country, if not the biggest contributor of, of expansions and deviations. And we have warned against this being entrenched as a norm as opposed to being an exception. And that's why we don't particularly like Note 3 because it took out an important check and balance of Treasury and now departments and entities are players and referees in the assessment of their own emergencies. So your budget said forensic. I think because you are giving figures, can we get the documents to the Secretariat? You read them so much fast with the dates. Honorable Mkondo. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm covered that you have talked about the national treasury and the deviations. It was, um, it, it, this is quite a lot of money that um, cannot just be spent um, without um, the national treasury agreeing to the deviation. But then my concern is the fact that um, the group executive security um, <clears throat> I would say for now it's her proposal was approved by the COO and then she is now suspended for her participation in that contract and the person who approved um, senior to her um, has been brought back for whatever reason back to the institution. And now the forensic investigation, I think, is initiated at top level, where the COO can be regarded as one to be at the top level, top executive of this institution. Um, I think there is conflict of interest. If, Chair, the investigation can be given to the SIU in, in, in one way or another because I don't understand how the COO uh, can't interfere with this uh, forensic investigations. Hence, he is part of the, the role players and he's the one who, he's the highest uh, 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 person on the ladder that has uh, uh, that did the 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 the, 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 the Thank you. I think that's the former COO, now current project director, and the GM security. Okay. Right. Please, yes, I, I just want to get an understanding. Even if it's an emergency contract, I was of the view that. Uh, it is still subject to section 217 of the Constitution in relation to fairness, equity, uh, competitiveness, and transparency. I don't think there's any legislation that can uh, supersede the Constitution of the country. Is this emergency contract not subjected to section 217 of the Constitution? I don't see any fairness if the the report came with only one service provider. Um, you could have saved costs, perhaps. I I'm just asking, maybe I'm naive, if you had uh, asked for three quotes. So, just to confirm, yes, no, there's no transaction that's not, uh, that overrides Section 217. So, even the instruction notes, even um, any other guidance you get from tre Treasury, you know, you have to conform to the five pillars. But you would note that sometimes you have to look at the five pillars together. 
and that's what we hope the managers are looking at together. So they're looking at speed and execution of delivery. We're looking at the security of the threat at that time and the time that it would get to get, for example, a, a normal competitive bidding process or quotes. So without also then compromising the outcome of <coughs> So Chair, without you know, compromising what, what, what would be dealt with in the interviews, et cetera, in the, in the investigation, essentially the test would be to see if they've applied their mind on all five pillars. And that's essentially what Note 3 also allows for, to say in emergency situations, we deviate from the normal way that we procure to expedite, to, to, to handle the emergency. And that's the only ways that, that line managers, for example, would run a, 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 a so-called procurement process or engagement with the supplier. But I think I mentioned towards the end in terms of the paper trail that this then has to get ratified by a DAA. So only certain people in the organization in terms of ESCOM's delegation of authority can declare an emergency, and, and obviously the CO is one of those people. But in concluding that emergency, it has to be ratified based on the value at an approval authority like a generation board or, or distribution board. So, so obviously that spend has to actually be um, verified after that. Well, the matters received is under investigation with all, the, with, with all those uh, um, factors combined. Right. Yes, ma'am. Chair, I want to just mention, I forgot to say, so, so we have prepared the same pack that I have for the SIU and the SAPS, uh, Chair, so that any other body that is doing the investigation has access to the same information. That's, that's good. Um, you see, uh, I heard because we've sort of interacted with ESCOM quite regularly, <coughs> you will park in specifically Expansions and deviations are a perennial headache in this institution, and in our view, largely abused. So I think you'd have to look at that, the delegations, um, the circumstances in which it, it happens, um, because any deviation in itself, when applied, it still has to be reasonable and rational. Um, it's not a cut branch. Um, so I just want to flag it for you, because it's something that perennially is there with, 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 with ESCOM. If you look at Treasury submissions prior note three, the very top ESCOM. Um, let me take this opportunity now to thank you colleagues um, for bearing the brutal brunt of the past uh, two and a half days. We did more traveling than most on the road and so on to thank you very much and colleagues. Tomorrow we are at National Treasury to deal with unauthorized expenditure, the full outstanding set, so that we can be able to schedule the necessary meetings to make a determination as to whether we are condoning or not. So for the full day of numbers tomorrow um, at National Treasury. So I think the early days also um, about that. I need your full concentration to we're going line item by line item on unauthorized expenditure. Some of it dates back to 2006, so we need to clear everything there so that we schedule them for September. So that's tomorrow. Uh, Friday, we've got REF, um, Road Accident Fund. I'm in receipt of a letter from the CEO, CEO of REF to the minister suggesting other dates saying that they're not available on Friday. And I've made the determination that with or without them, we will proceed with the REF uh, visit, particularly in operations and in the processing. So that Friday continues despite um, those proposals which fall outside in any case uh, our own program. So the Tomorrow, National Treasury, Friday, ref. there's nothing that has changed. To the board members, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, um, please convey our appreciation and thanks to the full compliments of the board from the chairperson um, and to you, Mr. Acting GCEO, with all your executives and your managers. Um, I thank you very much uh, for the interactions. And I hope that you will appreciate 
why we ask these questions. It's all in the pursuit of turning ESCOM around and ensuring the prevalence of good governance and electricity. It's all we want. It's for no case. It's all we want from you. Um, I must say, though, we have noted, GCO, the issue you raised on municipal debt. It is on our to-do list, but because there's so much wrong, somehow it keeps falling on the wayside, but uh, it is on our to-do list, so I think we will engage with it before the end of the year with yourselves and the affected uh, departments. I know Mr. Feminin has asked me about it about a month or two ago, or she wants it. So it's there, so we will be uh, working towards that. In conclusion, board, crack the whip. tolerate our presence knowing very well that we've got an electoral contract uh, which is ending next year. Boards are changed day in and day out, but the permanent feature are those who are on the daily in positions of operation who make or break this country. So in your tenure, crack the whip consequence management, work with the law enforcement agencies. And law enforcement agencies, I'll put SIU aside because we're not sharp, but keep it up. Shape up law enforcement agencies. Move with speed and agents. This is no pace in everything. It, it must stop. Akshesh, I'm really, after all is said and done, everywhere do what it is that you want to, that you need to do so that there is progress. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we, we, we will be reporting to Parliament soon in concluding these matters. There are only two loose ends here and there in this particular section of ESCOM. Madam Chair, I'll hand over to you for any concluding remarks, and then we will call it a day. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and um, may I say Thank you very much to all the honorable members of SCOPA. Um, these engagements are very important, just as much as um, the board, as I mentioned earlier on, our job is to get the executive into the eye of the storm so that we can think clearly. Um, your, what we do with you also helps us to crystallize. So as you ask questions, because um, uh, as you can appreciate the, the volume and, and the complexity that we deal with, um, it's quite easy to miss some things. It is really, really great that there's a, an additional um, set of eyes and the way you frame your questions really is very helpful. Um, so I thank you from that perspective. Chair, I, I thought besides the, the issues that we know are already on our radar, so I'm not going to mention everything, but just a few takeaways. Um, that I think um, would be important um, to mention. Um, Honorable Birkers, you, your, your point around the um, Scopus recommendations and, and how we make sure that we, we take it forward, one of the things that I thought that we should do as a board is maybe just go back, as we haven't had time to do that, is to go back to pre-our time and, and go and have a look at um, the recommendations made in the past so that we can check that everything um, is on the radar, because um, I personally am only aware of where I have first, uh, where I have seen um, us in, in, in our current um, the current board being present. Um, we were also, um, as we indicated earlier on, we circle back to the scope on the um, investigation that ENS has been tasked with, um, just to make sure that there is alignment between what the board's expectations are and what has been conveyed. Um, 
Chair, you mentioned that greater presence of um, a, uh, the leadership at the plants from head office. Um, that's part of what we're looking at, but we'll, we'll zero in there as well. Um, the vetting is something that I think we need to also just bring closer to our radar um, to make sure that we can um, tick all the boxes from that perspective. As you said, it is compulsory and we need to make sure that that is being done. Um, so just from a, you know, what, what gets measured gets done. So we'll make sure that that's on our agenda. I think also a very important one that I hadn't really, because you, you don't really project forward as much, is one of the things that we should do as a board is start to have conversations around when our term comes to an end, um, how do we ensure the continuity, so being proactive, um, so that the next um, group of people who take over from us, that they stand on, on, on firmer ground. Um, and then the history on the deviations, I think we also need to go back in history, because we, we see the snapshot in terms of where we are, but when you mentioned the history, I'm a little concerned about if this is a recurring theme, then that is um, one of the things that we, we need to um, uh, make sure that is on our radar. So there is a little bit of digging that we as a board need to do in terms of past recommendations from Scopus so that we, um, we are completely aligned. Uh, I think for the board, it would be very important um, that we understand 100% how we can make sure that you get what you need. Um, because it is a symbiotic relationship. Um, we get value out of the interactions with you, but we also need to make sure that you're able to execute your mandate effectively. Um, so the more we engage, the more we get that alignment. Because at the end of the day, it really is about um, our people, South Africa, um, and we need to work together to make sure that we get ISCOM to where it needs to be. And I once again thank you very much. And thank you for coming here and not making us <laughs> <laughs> Well, Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, uh, on that note, uh, if there's anything else, you can send it in writing. Happy afternoon. The meeting stands adjourned.